a service of KIVMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. This, I believe, a lively interest in interplanetary travel, fiscal theory, chess, and figure skating combine in the personality of Robert A. Heinlein. The motion picture, Destination Moon, and innumerable scientific fiction stories, novels, and television shows are products of his fertile imagination. He also has some stimulating beliefs on the more mundane and immediate problems of existence. This is Robert Heinlein's creed. I am not going to talk about religious beliefs, but about matters so obvious that it has gone out of style to mention them. I believe in my neighbors. I know their faults, and I know that their virtues far outweigh their faults. Take Father Michael down our road a piece. I'm not of his creed, but I know that goodness and charity and loving kindness shine in his daily actions. I believe in Father Mike. If I'm in trouble, I'll go to him. My next-door neighbor is a veterinary doctor. Doc will get out of bed after a hard day to help a stray cat. No fee, no prospect of a fee. I believe in Doc. I believe in my townspeople. You can knock on any door in our town, say, I'm hungry, and you will be fed. Our town is no exception. I found the same ready charity everywhere. For the one who says, the heck with you, I got mine, there are a hundred, a thousand, who will say, sure, pal, sit down. I know that, despite all warnings against hitchhikers, I can step to the highway, thumb for a ride, and, and in a few minutes, a car or a truck will stop, and someone will say, Climb in, Mac. How far are you going? I believe in my fellow citizens. Our headlines are splashed with crime, yet for every criminal, there are 10,000 honest, decent, kindly men. If it were not so, no child would live to grow up. Business could not go on from day to day. Decency is not news. It is buried in the obituaries but it is a force stronger than crime. I believe in the patient gallantry of nurses, in the tedious sacrifices of teachers. I believe in the unseen and unending fight against desperate odds that goes on quietly in almost every home in the land. I believe in the honest craft of workmen. Take a look around you. There never were enough bosses to check up on all that work. From Independence Hall to the Grand Coulee Dam, these things were built level and square by craftsmen who were honest in their bones. I believe that almost all politicians are honest. For every bribed alderman, there are hundreds of politicians, low paid or not paid at all, doing, doing their level best, without thanks or glory, to make our system work. If this were not true, we would never have gotten past the 13 colonies. I believe in Roger Young. You and I are free today because of endless, unnamed heroes from Valley Forge to the Yalu River. I believe in, I am proud to belong to, the United States. Despite shortcomings from lynchings to bad faith in high places, our nation has had the most decent and kindly internal practices and foreign policies to be found anywhere in history. And finally, I believe in my whole race, yellow, white, black, red, brown, in the honesty, courage, intelligence, durability, and goodness of the overwhelming majority of my brothers and sisters everywhere on this planet. I am proud to be a human being. I believe that we have come this far by the skin of our teeth, that we always make it just by the skin of our teeth, but that we will always make it, survive, endure. I believe that this hairless embryo with the aching, oversized brain case and the opposable thumb this animal barely up from the apes will endure, will endure longer than his home planet, will spread out to the other planets, to the stars and beyond, carrying with him his honesty, his insatiable curiosity, his unlimited courage, and his noble essential decency. This I believe with all my heart. That was Robert A. Heinlein of Colorado Springs, Colorado, a writer and an engineer with an outlook on the future. Good evening. This is Ken Roberts inviting you to listen to another adventure of Casey, crime photographer. Ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. 
Our adventure for tonight, Unlucky Numbers. Afternoon at the Blue Note Cafe. And Casey and Ethelbert are discussing a very delicate situation. It's a very delicate situation, Casey. Gladys wants to marry me, I think. Now, Ethelbert, what makes you think that? She said so. Oh. And what I'm scared of is if I don't ask her to marry me, she'll be mad. If I do ask her to marry me, she'll marry me. Hmm. Casey, what am I going to do? Ethelbert, you must be firm. Yeah? Yes, sir. It's been my experience that once you let a woman get the upper hand, you're done for. Uh, Casey. Be the boss. Casey. Yeah, and whatever you do, Ethelbert, don't forget. Oh, oh, Uh, Miss Williams. Forget what, Casey? Oh, (laughs) Annie. Annie? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Ethelbert and I were just, uh, you you know, that, uh, well, we were just... uh, I know. You were teaching him to be firm. Uh, I once worked for a firm. Don't change the subject, Ethelbert. Anyway, Casey, Burke has an assignment for us. Uh, What? Do a story on the numbers racket. Why? What do you mean, why? Oh, is Burke off on another one of his crusading kicks, clean up the town? All I well, what's know. What's so terrible about the numbers? If a guy wants to be a sucker, he bets a buck. Maybe he loses the buck. Maybe he wins. I don't know. 550. 550 what? Bucks. If you win, that's the odds. You bet on the last three digits of the treasury balance. Well, what's the harm in that? Well, don't look at me. All I know is Burke said to get the lowdown, something to break it up. So, let's go. Well, go where? How do you start? Well, you could ask Steve Polachek. Oh? Steve Polachek. He plays the numbers. Well, that's a start. Where does this Steve Polachek live? Over on Ward Street, 22, I think it is. Uh-huh. Oh, come on, Casey. Okay. All right. Of all the silly assignments Burke ever handed us, this is without a... Fertile brain decide to get a story that'll break up the numbers racket. Of all the silly assignments to send us on, this is without a doubt. Well, this is where I came in. What? <laughs> Ring the bell again. Oh, well, I did. It looks like Polachek's not home. Yes? Oh, hello. Uh, we're looking for Mr. Steve Polachek. Does he live here? It's no home yet. Soon, maybe. You'd like to come in and wait? Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. I, uh, Steve's mother. You are friends with him? No, we're just here about the numbers game. Numbers? Go away. What? Go away. Go fast. Now, before he comes. Go away. Go away. Go away. (laughs) She's all right now, Casey. I'm sorry we upset you, Mrs. Polachek. I forgot to say that we were from the Express, you know, the newspaper. It's it's all right. Excuse, please, uh, Mr. Casey, Miss Williams. I, I think when you say numbers, I think you come sell Steve numbers. Well, we haven't. But even if we had, Mrs. Polachek, why should you be so upset? Oh, it's bad, it's bad. But why? Well, it's like sick with my Steve. It's like sick. Sick? From betting? Mr. Casey, now you listen. You know a man that uh, drink, maybe. No can stop. Well, sure, but... Uh... Well, numbers like that with my Steve. He no can stop. No can stop. You want a story for newspaper? All right. I tell you a story. Now, Steve and me, we want farm and country. Little farm, chickens, uh, maybe cow, you know. I know. So we save money. Steve is a good boy, works on shop. Every week, bring home money for save. Three dollars, sometimes maybe five. I put money in sugar bowl. It's good. I save. Uh, go on, Mrs. Polachek. I save. I wait. There's just no hurry. Good things you got to wait for. But Steve, all the time he hurry. No can wait. Young, you know, lots of time he has. But <laughs> no can wait. Yeah, I see. Then, one time Steve, no bring money for save. He spent three dollars for bet for numbers. He say if he win, he have money for payment on farm. So he bet. Well, did he win? No. He no win that week. So he bet money next week. He no win and next week and next and next and next and he no win never. Oh, that's bad. Every week he spend money for bet more and more, and then he take money from sugar bowl. Well, pretty soon sugar bowl is empty. Then he take money from me more and more and more. Now I no can pay bills. Me. Clara Polachek, and who can pay bills? And then who can stop? Clara? Oh. Uh, in parlor, Steve. Well, what are you doing in there? I was... Uh, oh. Steve, uh, this uh, Mr. Casey, uh, Miss Williams, my friend. Uh, yeah. glad to meet you. Hello, Steve. Hello, Steve. Uh, Ma, can I, uh, 
talk to you for a minute? Well, I'm here. Talk. Yeah, yeah, well, I I, I mean in, in private. Well, we'll wait outside. No, stay, listen. What do you want, Steve? But, Ma... What would you want, Steve? Two bucks, Ma. Just two bucks. Sugar bowl is empty, Steve. From the housekeeping money, I mean. It's gone too, Steve. But I need the dough. What'll I do, Ma? Stop gambling. Ma, please don't pick on me. Uh, Mrs. Parchak, we'll leave you alone. No, no, stay, listen. Steve, I no pick on you. Yes, you do. Don't you see, Ma? I don't want to gamble. I got to. I lost too much to quit now when my number's bound to come up. And when it does come up, Ma, we'll be rich. What for we want to be rich? He's enough to save, pay bills, put money in sugar bowls. Yeah, sure. Lousy nickels and dimes so we can buy a farm in a hundred years. Oh, it's not true. There's lots of money in sugar bowl before... Before what? Well, go ahead and say it. Before I swipe the money to gamble. That's what you was going to say, huh? Stevie, please. Before I rob the sugar bowl, before I swipe the money. Stevie, I, I no blame you. You can't talk about nothing else but your lousy sugar bowl. Stevie. Lousy old sugar bowl with a lousy old crack in it. All empty. Look at it, all empty. And I don't care, you hear me, Ma? I don't care. I don't care about your lousy old sugar bowl. Oh, Ma, Ma, help me. Somebody help me. Steve. Oh, Ma, I can't stop. It's like, like being drunk or crazy. Every week I get my dough and I say... This time, I'll, I'll bring it home to Ma, all of it. And then that guy comes along with his, his lousy numbers, and I I can't stop. Those numbers, guys, Ma, I wish they was all dead. So do I, Steve. So do I. <laughs> That's what he said, Logan. I wish they was all dead. And me, two hours ago, I said, what harm is there in the numbers? Mm, you should have seen this Polachek boy, Captain Logan. Nice kid, but mm, all shot to pieces. Yeah, I know. They get like that. Well, they shouldn't. With the odds against him, the guy who bets doesn't have a prayer. Why can't you cops do something about it? That's not my department, Casey. Talk to the vice boys. They pick up the guys who sell tickets, but two more always sprout from the same spot. Trouble is, nobody knows who operates this thing. Well, I'm going to find out. How? Oh. oh. Maybe I'll pretend to be one of the numbers boys myself. Casey, I got news for you. Two years ago, a plain clothesman discovered their hangout was Al's pool hall over on 10th. That's all. He just discovered their hangout. The next day, we discovered him. Murdered. Oh. Yeah? Yeah. It's still on the books. Unsolved. Maybe I ought to mosey over to Al's pool. Now, uh, Casey, please. Now, even if you're a, a stinker, I like you better alive than dead. I'm glad to hear that, Annie. If anyone wants me, I'll be over at Al's pool hall. That's a nice pool hall Al's got here, huh? Yeah. Nice tables. Yeah. You're new. I ain't seen you before. I'm new. None of the boys, they ain't seen you before. Well, I'm new. Numbers? Huh? Wait for Andy? Uh-huh. South side? That's right. Andy don't operate on the south side. He does now. What do you mean? He started this morning. You mean he's taken over to Reed territory? Figure it out yourself. Well, that's good news. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, they call me Whitey. Like a game of pool? Sure. They call me Duke. Reason I cased you first off, we've got to be careful. Sure. Yeah, I'll break. One ball in the side pocket. Sure. Hot today, Whitey. Something in the corner. How's the numbers going, Whitey? Fair, fair, fair. Collected nearly three G's this week with no hits. Didn't have to pay out a cent, huh? Not one. Eight ball on the side. But we've got to operate careful. Sure. The newspapers are getting after us. Sure. Yeah. This guy Casey over at the Express. Him and a reporter named Williams. 
See the stories they're writing up? Uh, sure. That guy Casey's going to wake up some morning and find himself dead, you know? Sure. Glad you dropped in today, pal. What's up? This case, he's getting on our necks. Well, at least we haven't let him know who our boss is yet. No, we got to keep our mouths shut. He's a great guy, the boss. Sure. I never met him. Great guy. Sure, I guess so. Bank shot on the three, huh? Yeah. He never comes around here, does he? A boss in a crumb bum joint like this? <laughs> Don't be funny. Arthur Matheson is a gentleman. What do you say today, Whitey? The word is to take it slow, pal. Yeah, what's up? This Williams Damon is Casey on the Express. They're finding out too much. Well, like what? Those stories they write in the Express. The cops will be turning the heat on us. Watch it, pal. Huh? What? A cop heading in here. Casey! Oh, Casey, I just happened to catch sight of you through the window. Thought I'd say hello. How are you? Uh, oh, fine. You kind of out of your territory down here, ain't you? Yeah. Well, I was seeing you, Casey. Come on. A cop called you Casey. Now, ain't that a coincidence? This guy at the Express I was just talking about, he knows a lot of cops, and his name is Casey, too. Casey, huh? Could it be you're the same Casey as that louse on the Express? What do you think, Whitey? I think you are. What do you think I've got in this pocket, a handkerchief? Why, you... This is that newspaper photographer, Casey, boys. Don't move, Whitey. Don't move, anybody. I'm getting out of here. You, get away from that door. You, too. Better. So long, boys. See you later. This case, he just backs out of the place and beats it, boss. Uh, Mr. Matheson, uh, we couldn't do nothing. He was packing a rod. He was packing a handkerchief, Whitey. Huh? Yeah, the whole story is right here on the express, see? They call it a clever ruse. Well, what do you know? My name is in that story, Whitey. Yeah, I, I see. And I'm displeased, Whitey. Very displeased. I don't blame you, Mr. Matheson. How did this Casey person learn about me? Well, uh, he's been hanging around Al's pool hall for a long time, and you know how it is, boss. Some of the boys ain't careful like me. Some of the boys get a little lick it up when they talk too much. Yeah. Whitey, remember what happened to that cop that nosed around Al's pool hall two years ago? Oh, yeah. Now, if we could lure Casey over to the house with the silver door. Yeah, yeah, the silver door. I could call him up with a phony newspaper story. Now, better have Gloria do it. Yeah, that's better, Gloria. Have her give him some human interest story about uh, something about, let's see, oh, a kitten that joined a litter of puppies. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And Whitey. Yeah, Mr. Matheson. I note that your receipts have been extraordinarily low for the last few days. You haven't collected much money. Aren't you working, Whitey? Oh, yes, Mr. Matheson. I'm working hard. Well, I'd suggest you work harder, Whitey. Much harder. Now get going. Hello, Steve. What? You. Leave me alone, will you, Whitey? How much you want to bet tonight, Steve? I huh? tell you, leave me alone. Just leave me alone. How about that little farm your mother was planning on, Steve? All you got to do is call the numbers right just once, and it's yours. Oh, cut it out, Whitey. Please cut it out. I'm taking my pay envelope home tonight, you understand? Sure, sure. But you're due for a break, Steve. And 20 bucks will pay you nine grand if you hit it. I thought you guys was going to be stopped. Nine thousand bucks, Steve. There's your farm. What do you say? Bet 20? 
Okay, okay, 20 bucks on the same number. But this is the last time you're going to make me open my pay envelope. That guy in the paper, that, that, that Casey, he'll get you guys, the whole pack of you. I'll tell you a secret, Steve. Casey's through. The boys at the Silver Door are going to take care of him. Permanent. Casey, I tell you, it's dangerous. Those boys are out to get you. They're bound to be now. Oh, sure, Ann, well, but get I... this whole business up, will you? Drop it. I can't. Why not? Well... Matheson's the head man, and you found that out. Now, let the police handle it from now on. I've just been talking to Logan. The cops haven't got a thing on Matheson. They can't touch him. That's a very sharp guy, that Matheson. He hasn't made any mistakes. Well, don't you make any. Drop the whole thing while you still can, please. Oh, excuse me, anyway. Photography, Casey talking. Yeah? Oh, where? Wait a minute. Nine, two, six. Okay. Well, thank you very much. What was that? <laughs> Some dame over at 926 Bain Street. She calls me. She's got a great human interest story. A kitten got in with a litter of puppies. <laughs> How cute. That's all I got to worry about. Now, listen, Annie, about Madison. Now, Casey, please, forget Madison. Forget the numbers and keep out of danger. Let, let, let's cover that puppy story, Casey. Oh, but please, Annie... Please, I'm scared. I'm scared for you. Please. Okay, Annie, okay. All right, I'll go with you just for a change. I'll take time off to clear my brain. Tell the desk where we're going. I'll get some film for my camera. <laughs> Quite sure everything is taken care of, Whitey. Don't worry, boss. Case, you'll be here. Gloria phoned him with that puppy story like you suggested. G- Mr. Madison. What? That's him. That's Casey getting out of that car just across the street. Oh. Hey, he's got some fame with him. Now, don't get excited, Whitey. Remember what we planned. Let them come up the walk and ring the doorbell. Well, uh, what about the dame? Uh, the lady must suffer sometimes for the comfort she keeps. Okay. I remember, Whitey. Let him climb the porch step. Let him ring the doorbell. And then we'll deal with Mr. Casey. Uh, this is it, Casey. 926 Bain Street. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Watch it, Annie. Yeah. The porch steps are rickety again. What? Wait, wait, wait. Uh, I... Oh, oh, Mrs. Polachek. Oh, Mr. Casey... Mr. Williams, thank goodness I catch. What's the matter, Mrs. Polichek? I, I telephoned you paper. They say you come here, so I come. Oh, what for? To warn. Warn? What about? It's danger. Mr. Casey, man on numbers, he mad at you. Oh, well, that's old news, Mrs. Polichek, but thank you. Oh, man. no, wait, listen. Why, Stevie, tell me what man say. What man? His name is uh, Whitey, no? Yeah, Whitey. What do you say? Oh, something about Silver Doll. Somebody by uh, Silver Doll gonna hurt you. Uh, how you say, uh, gonna get you? Casey. Annie. Silver door. Do you know what that is? No. Well, you'll stay away from it, whatever it is, and I'll see to that. Oh, thanks, Mrs. Polichek. Oh. Yes, thanks for the tip, Mrs. No, Polichek. No, thank me. You just be careful about silver door. Yes, yeah, silver door, silver door. Sounds like a nightclub. Well, keep away from nightclubs. Gee. Casey, ring the bell. No, oh, okay. I was just thinking about it. Anne. What? The door. What, what door? This one, right here. Casey. The house with a silver door. Come on, Ann. We're getting out of here fast. Think they saw us? I don't know. Quick. Get in the car. Yeah. Uh, hurry. I am. Take a look at the house, Ann. See anybody? Uh, no. Uh, What's the matter with a starter? Stay to the house. Two men are coming out of the house. Why do you mess? Get this car going. I can't. The motor won't start. Oh, What's the matter, Casey? Motor trouble. Whitey. That's right. And this here is Mr. Matheson. Oh, hello, Mr. Casey. I must apologize about your car. An associate of mine, quite uh, mechanically inclined, disconnected a wire or something. Uh, Fix it, Whitey, and then we'll get going. Now, just a minute. You may drive, Mr. Casey, but you'd better follow instructions. Whitey and I carry more than uh, handkerchiefs in our pockets. Don't we, Whitey, eh? Take your next left, Mr. Casey, please. You're not going to get away with this, Madison. Why not? Because the cops know I tied you up to the numbers rack. Go on. Well, if anything happens to Casey or me, the police will know you're responsible. Not if anything happens, Miss Williams. What do you mean? 
The police might very well suspect me in a crude case of murder, say, uh, shooting or knifing. But if Mr. Casey happened to drive this car off a cliff... I'm not likely to drive it off a cliff. Oh, yes, you are, Mr. Casey. Very likely. In fact, you're going to. No one will ever prove you were knocked out ahead of time, and there will be a smell of liquor about you and Miss Williams. Just an unfortunate case of drunken driving. Accidental death. Gee, boss, you think of everything. Well, I try to, Whitey, I try. Keep straight ahead, please, Mr. Casey. Never make a mistake, do you, Max? That's what they say. But you just made one now. No, you just did. I said keep straight ahead. I did not tell Hey, boss, he's going to car fast. I'm going to go a good deal faster. Casey, look out. There's a red light. There was a red light. Casey, you seem to forget I have a gun and I'll use it if I have to. I'm driving, Madison. We're doing 70 right now. Shoot me and we'll all wind up dead. Hey, boss, it's the cops. What do we do? Casey, look out. Boss, I'll grab the wheel. You keep covered. Oh. Get away, you fool. Give me that wheel. Why they cut it? Casey! <laughs> Casey, another pillow behind your back? Oh, uh, no, thanks, Ethelbert. Miss Williams, another pillow under your... No, thanks, Ethelbert. <clears throat> Gee, you two look terrible. Got to see the other guys. Whitey and Matheson? Yeah, that wise cookie Matheson finally made a mistake. You mean going driving with you? I mean, the police finally got a nice long list against him, from violation of the Sullivan Act to attempted murder, plus a confession that he was running the numbers right. Oh, speaking of violations, how many red lights did you go through, Casey? Oh, only about eight. Oh, which reminds me, Annie, do you think Logan can fix a ticket for reckless driving? I hope not. That'll teach you to slam me into lampposts at 40 miles an hour, I feel like. Well... Look, look who just came in. Hello, Mrs. Polachek and Steve. Oh, hello there. Hello, Mrs. Stevie. You, uh, you feel bad, no? <laughs> we feel bad, yes. Oh. Oh, not really, no. Just a few bruises. Good, good. I, I come with Steve to thank. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You don't have to thank us. Oh, yes, yes. There's much to thank. Now, no more numbers. Steve gamble no more. We put money away for farm. And Steve. Gamma? Money, I forget. Give me $3 now for save. So, Miss Williams, Mr. Casey can see. Oh, okay, Ma. I... Oh, uh... Settle for a dollar and a half, Ma. Steve. Steve, you... No, say... take it easy, Ma. Take it easy. But, Steve, what'd you do with another dollar and a half? Well, look, I, I broke your sugar bowl, remember? And, well, you always like blue, don't you? So I, I bought a blue sugar bowl to start fresh, Ma. Oh, sh- Here. You are good boy, Steve. Good boy. Blue sugar bowl no cost dollar and a half. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, Ma. So... Well, I had to buy some flowers for Miss Williams, didn't I? And a tie for Mr. Casey, didn't I? Just to say thanks, didn't I? Tonight's adventure was written by Alonzo Dean Cole. Scott Cotsworth played the part of Casey, Jan Miner was Anne, and John Gibson was Ethelbert. Next week, another adventure of Casey, crime photographer. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
This I believe. The realities of life are seldom easy to face. But sometimes the tougher the breaks, the more stoutly a man meets them. Robert G. Allman is blind. Yet he lives a fuller life than many people supposedly in possession of all their faculties. One of the first blind athletes in the country, he became a champion wrestler at the University of Pennsylvania. He swims, he is president of the National Blind Golfers Association, and he has been a radio sports commentator. Now he is a successful Philadelphia lawyer and insurance broker. His secret? Perhaps a glimpse of his personal philosophy will provide a clue to the answer. I lost my sight when I was four years old by falling off a boxcar in a freight yard in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and landing on my head. Now I am 32. I can vaguely remember the brightness of sunshine and what color red is. It would be wonderful to see again, but a calamity can do strange things to people. It occurred to me the other day that I might not have come to love life so as I do if I hadn't been blind. I believe in life now. I am not so sure that I would have believed in it so deeply otherwise. I don't mean that I would prefer to go without my eyes. I simply mean that the loss of them made me more appreciate what I had left. Life, I believe, asks a continuous series of adjustments to reality. The more readily a person is able to make these adjustments, the more meaningful his own private world becomes. The adjustment is never easy. I was bewildered and afraid, but I was lucky. My parents and my teachers saw something in me, oh, a potential to live, you might call it, which I didn't see, and they made me want to fight it out with blindness. The hardest lesson I had to learn was to believe in myself. That was basic. If I hadn't been able to do that, I would have collapsed and become a chair rocker on the front porch for the rest of my life. When I say belief in myself, I am not talking about simply the kind of self-confidence that helps me down an unfamiliar staircase alone. That is part of it. But I mean something bigger than that, an assurance that I am, despite imperfections, a real positive person, that somewhere in the sweeping, intricate pattern of people, there is a special place where I can make myself fit. It took me years to discover and strengthen this assurance. It had to start with the most elementary things. When I was a youngster, once a man gave me an indoor baseball. I thought he was mocking me, and I was hurt. I can't use this, I said. Take it with you, he urged me, and roll it around. The words stuck in my head. Roll it around. Roll it around. By rolling the ball, I could listen where it went. This gave me an idea how to achieve a goal I had thought impossible, playing baseball. At Philadelphia's Overbrook School for the Blind, I invented a successful variation of baseball. We called it ground ball. All my life, I have set ahead of me a series of goals and then tried to reach them one at a time. I had to learn my limitations. It was no good to try for something I knew at the start was wildly out of reach because that only invited the bitterness of failure. I would fail sometimes anyway, but on the average, I made progress. I believe I made progress more readily because of a pattern of life shaped by certain values. I find it easier to live with myself if I try to be honest. I find strength in the friendship and interdependence of people. I would be blind indeed without my sighted friends. And very humbly I say that I have found purpose and comfort in a mortal's ambition toward godliness. Perhaps a man without sight is blinded less by the importance of material things than other men are. All I know is that a belief in the higher existence of a nobility for men to strive for has been an inspiration that has helped me more than anything else to hold my life together. Those were the convictions of Robert G. Allman, a sightless young Philadelphia attorney who walks without a cane because he says it is necessary to get out and rub elbows with life. Crime does not pay. How much you get for the coat, kid? Half a C. Not bad, not bad at all. Not so bad it stinks. Eddie. Save it, Jackie. You know it as well as I do. We take a chance on jail, snatch the coat. The price tag says 250 so the Fagin gives us half a C. Fifty lousy bucks. That's a sucker's racket. It's beer and pretzels, ain't it? I hate beer. And pretzels only make me thirsty. So beautiful. Maybe you got an idea? (laughs) Have I got an idea? Gather round, boys. Have I got an idea? In the interest.
interest of good citizenship and law enforcement, we present Crime Does Not Pay, based on the famous Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer series of short subjects. In just a moment, you will hear Clothes Make the Woman, starring Jean Muir. Now, Crime Does Not Pay, starring Jean Muir as Betty Page in Clothes Make the Woman. Every year, hundreds of thousands of dollars are lost by department stores, large and small. Lost through the activities of shoplifters. Every store maintains its protective force, its detectives, but still the losses mount. In the end, the thieves are caught. But the stolen goods have passed through the hands of the fences into the possession of perfectly decent citizens who are susceptible to bargains. Betty Page and her boyfriend Jackie Benson worked in this racket. One of their operations was like this. I'd like to see something a little more expensive, Miss. Yes, Miss. My wife and I don't buy a new winter coat every year, and when we do, uh, maybe you've got something with fur on it. If you'll step this way, please. Thank you. Now, this is our most expensive line of fur trim cloth coats. Oh, they're lovely. Uh, which one should I try on, Jack, dear? Well, I like that blue one with the big fluffy collar. That's a fox collar. Oh, may I put it on, Miss? Oh, certainly, madam. Do you, uh, do you like the color, Jack, dear? It looks a little dull. So blue, it's almost black. Well, it won't look like this in daylight, will it, Miss? No, it'll be a little lighter. Well, uh, could we see it in daylight, Miss? I noticed some windows out near the elevator. I'm afraid I couldn't leave this part of the floor that long. Oh, you wouldn't have to come along. My wife and I'll be right back. Come along, dear. Oh, Mr. Jack, that they seem like such nice people. They all seem like nice people, Carter. They fool even me sometimes. <laughs> really, Mary, how could you have let it go so long before you called me? But, but it is a long walk in the windows for the elevator. We were so busy I didn't dare leave the floor, Mr. Martin. Oh, no. $250. I don't know how I'll ever pay it back. Now, easy, easy, young lady. The store is insured, you know. Now, tell me once more exactly what happened. Like I said, Mr. Tack, they seemed like such a nice couple. You hear the names? Just, just Betty and Jack. Go on. Well, she liked the coat. He wanted to see it in daylight. I, I let them go to the elevators with it. There are windows there. Oh, I, I'm so sorry, Mr. Martin. She left her own coat on the chair. A coat worth twelve fifty at the most. Natalie asked to see the more expensive models. You're altogether too trusting, Mary. Not anymore, I'm not. Give you fifty. What, on a two hundred and fifty dollar coat? After we risked our necks to get it? I left my own coat there. My coat cost me a hundred. You get fifty. Oh, now look here, Louis. Now I know why they call you Fagin. Some fence you are. Favorite. I gotta get some profit. You didn't do any work. I'm taking risks, ain't I? For risk, a businessman is entitled to a profit. <laughs> what risk do you take? What will I get out of it? A cloth coat with a piece of fox. A hundred bucks. So I give you fifty so we come out even. Yeah, and we do the work. Enough talk. Fifty. Take it or leave it. Jack? Ah, uh, what's the use? Take it, Betty. Better than nothing. <laughs> Joey, hi, you fella. Oh, cold. I could use a drink. Hey, Betty, it's a dip. Hi, Joey. Beautiful, a man wants a drink. I heard him. I'm reading the paper. Okay, honey. Betty's sore, Joey. Fagin chiseled us as usual. Louie, that thief? Yeah. Well, he pays as much as anybody. I suppose. This stuff ain't as good as it would have been if we'd got more for the coat. 
<laughs> not too bad. How much you get for the coat, kid? Half a C. It's not bad, not bad at all. Oh, it's so bad it stinks. So beautiful? Maybe you got an idea? <laughs> Have I got an idea? Gather round, boys. Have I got an idea? Right here in the paper. The newspaper? Uh-huh. You're in on this, too. We'll need an extra hand. What's my cut? Three ways equal. Out of what we get from Louie? This ideal works so slick, there'll be plenty for everybody, even at Louie's rate of pay. Hey, this sounds interesting. Go ahead, kid. Just let me read you this. See the picture? All right, that society dame, what's she got that you ain't, baby? That sable coat. Ten grand if it's a dollar. So, kid, so? Listen. Mrs. Louise Williams, shown above at a recent charity function in smart Rosedale Manor, is one of the sponsors of a milk fund luncheon to be given at the home of Mrs. Joseph Barton two weeks from today. Also present at the forthcoming benefit affair will be Mrs. Barlow Sampson, Miss Josephine Cowan. Good after... Oh. The service entrance is around at the back. Sorry, there's no time for that. Mrs. Barton called us at the last minute and told us the luncheon guests will be arriving in uh, just about 45 minutes. Very well, come in. Uh, where do you wish to set up? Anywhere convenient off this foyer. Joe, give me a hand with the coat racks and... Uh... I'm Jameson. Yes, well, Jameson, where can the lady go to freshen up? There's a lavatory down the hall. Third door on the right. Thank you, Jameson. These are the base for the code rack, Jack. Back to the loading. Okay. Pull around the back and get comfortable in the car. Later. Right, till later. Shall I send someone to lend a hand with the rack? Well, you could hold this hand. What? <laughs> no, I guess you couldn't. Hmm. Is there anything you will need before the guests arrive? Well, there's nothing I'll need. Except for you to go ahead and tend to your uh, butt wing, if that's the word. Hmm. How do I look down? You in black satin. Hey, it's me. How'd you pour yourself into that? And why? There's no men around this operation except me, Joey, and that Jameson. Well, that's why, dear. Some of these society ladies show everything they've got, and I intend to keep your mind on me <laughs> and the job. Are the racks ready? All in place. Hey, look at the frail coming down the stairs. That's Mrs. Barton, you dope. Now you know why I'm wearing what I'm wearing. May I ask, please, what you're doing here? Uh, oh, I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Barton. You are Mrs. Barton, aren't you? Yes, I am. Explain yourself, please, young lady. Well, your butler, Jameson, called us. The Acme Portable Hat and Coat Checking Service. This is our specialty service in private homes. And half of our tips go to the fund which the functions we service are given for. Hmm. That's a nice idea. Strange Jameson didn't tell me he'd call you. Well, he called us half an hour ago in the rush of preparation he must have forgotten. Perhaps. I've been dressing during the last half hour. Oh, excuse me, the door. I'll answer it, madam. Never mind, Jameson. I want you to check the service pantry. Thank you, madam. Oh, what a life he leads. Yes, madam. No, madam. I'll do it, madam. Shh, quiet, you fool. Louise, darling. Marty, dear. I'm so glad you came early. But I thought I might have something to do. Not a thing, darling, not a thing. So have a cocktail and keep me company. Well, that would be a pleasure. Check your coat, dear. Tips go to the milk fund. Of course. It's a wonderful idea. I do so hate to have all the bedrooms mussed with coats and things. It was Jameson's idea. One of these days, I'm going to steal that man right from under your roof. <laughs> <laughs> you try, darling. Just you try. Oh, no, wait. Just a moment. Let me see that coat on you. Oh, haven't you seen it before? Only in that picture in the Tribune. Oh, it's luscious. Leopold, of course. Oh, thank you, dear. Yes, of course it's Leopold. Could anyone else match skins like these? Uh, here's my coat, young lady. Thank you, ma'am. We'll take care of it for you. May I compliment you, young lady, on the way you pleased Mrs. Barton's guest? Thanks, Jameson. Now you've said your piece, run along. Well, really. After all, one could be polite. What sort of hand does he want to make or something? <laughs> could be. I understand black satin has an effect on some men. Oh, it has on me, baby. Nothing any of the dames in there was wearing could make them look like you. Save it, darling. we got work to do. You hear you? Sure, Joey heard me coming. Okay, kids. 
I'm out here waiting all set. Here they come, Joey. Wait till Louie sees this hall. Mink, Persian lamb, broadtail, sable, and all real. Here, yeah, Joey. It's the first load. There's about 30 coats here. No, no, Jackie. Not all of them. You want to leave some? Got them. Next pile. Hold it, Joey. Betty's going nuts. Not me. I'm smart. The three coats you just put through that window are worth about 15 grand. Okay. We take six more, including Louise Williams. We'll have over 50 grand in the hall. But we leave the rest. So nobody will suspect anything until the women whose coats we took come looking for them. By that time, we'll be miles away. Get it, Jackie? <laughs> Got it, beautiful. <laughs> In just a moment, Crime Does Not Pay will continue with Clothes Make the Woman. Now we continue with Crime Does Not Pay, starring Gene Muir as Betty Page in Clothes Make the Woman. <music> Stolen goods have little value unless there is a market for them. It's up to the fence, the receiver of the goods, to find that market. In the case of Betty Page and her friends, Louis Fagan Keller had to find the market. He waited a sufficient length of time and then approached his first possible customer. Who is it? You decent, Patty? Who is it? Louis Keller, remember? Not my favorite bargain hunter. And find it. <laughs> Do I get into the dressing room with the best torch singer in town? <laughs> At least in your opinion. Come on in, Louis. Get yourself comfortable. I gotta make a change. Yeah. Hey, you're looking wonderful, Patty. Louie, when I come out from behind this screen, you're going to need another word. That's all. Go away, Louie. No top, no back, practically no front. And cost an arm and a leg. <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I bet on that. Uh, Patty, uh, in a market for real bargain? But what is it this time, Louie? Ice? No. Sable. Yikes. Yeah. You got it on you? I'm not crazy yet. You don't carry ten G's worth of sables around like they were silver foxes. Are they hot? Now you know me better than that, Patty. Do I? Say, hey, how a look. <laughs> good enough to eat and then some. Um, sables go good with gold lamé. Not hot sables. I don't peddle hot stuff, Patty. You know that. Well, how then? Well, some people went broke. I bailed them out of hot. Wife gave me the coat for cash. Oh, I believe you. How much? Five G's. Too much. What's your offer? Uh, two five. Not a nickel less than three five. I gave two foot myself. Three five, it's a deal. When? Tonight, when you finish your last number. That patty <laughs> is Keller service. <laughs> We've waited so long. You don't seem to understand. We understand, Mrs. Barton. You called us here when the theft was discovered. We questioned your butler and the other servants. Your butler says the code check people told him you called them. You say they told you he called them. Total zero. When we have nothing to work with, Mrs. Barton, there's practically nothing we can do. Except wait. Wait, Lieutenant? How long? For what? No one knows how long. For a break. A break? But surely the insurance company... They have their own people. They've seen us. They think it's your butler. Jameson? Impossible. He worked for my father, now for me. He's known me since I was born. People get funny ideas sometimes when they need money. Jameson wants for nothing. He never will. Nothing you know of, Mrs. Barton. Now, let it be, Stone. The butler's all right. So are the other servants. In fact, they're so all right and so used to everything being normal, they were perfect setups for the crowd that pulled this job. Surely, Lieutenant, there must be something you can do. I won't be able to hold up my head in my house to have such a thing happen. When the break comes, Mrs. Barton, we'll be ready. But what kind of a break, Lieutenant? Mrs. Barton, 85% of the population of our prisons talk themselves in. We'll get our break with patience. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 
You should have seen her drool when she saw that coat, Patty. Oh, I drooled myself. I wish I could have kept it. Patty Laurel, without a brain in her head, gets to wear that coat. What do we care? She's got the coat, we got the dough. I know you kids had come through with a big idea. Once, anyway. Once? What do you mean by that? Well, you can't pull a stunt like that again. Oh, can't we? Now, look, Betty, let's not take chances. We pulled down 15 grand on that deal of no income tax. Shut up and listen. Okay, okay. Aren't you riding high, kid? Never mind that, Fagan. Get this. There hasn't been a word in the papers about the Barton job. Not one word. <laughs> How they hate to be taken, that kind of people. But okay, that means nobody's talking. So for the next job, we pick a spot a few miles from Rosedale, and nobody will be wise. Smart. Smart as a whip, but not too soon. There's no sense taking chances, and we don't have to. What scared you, darling? Dick Davis. Who's he? You remember, don't you, the party Joey threw to celebrate our hall? What, that, that little one with a squint? That's him. Best second story man I ever did business with. Yeah, well, he's in a tank. What? Yesterday. Went back to a neighborhood too soon. Picked him up, caught him on a job. Oh, so he pulled a boner. And he had a piece on him. Armed robbery, 20 years. Poor Jake. His own fault for getting caught. They won't take me that way. See what I've got, boys. Betty, where'd you get that piece? It's a souvenir, a war souvenir, 25 caliber, a lady's gun. Fellow I bought it from says it packs a terrific punch. Now, that's no good, kid. You lose it someplace. If we do another job, don't carry it. Not carry it? Now, boys, you know everything's going on these days. A girl wouldn't think of wearing her minx unless she had some protection. <laughs> Look, Davis, we're not playing dominoes. You got a choice. 20 years to life for armed robbery, or we'll pin the 4th Street killing on you. You can't do that. You can't, Lieutenant. You wouldn't fight an innocent man. Oh, wouldn't I? But I don't know nothing. I always worked alone. You know that. Please, Lieutenant, give me a break, will you? You had to have someone sell your halls for you. Who was it? I sold it myself. Peddler, honest. Stone, uh, yeah. is the conference room free? The one downstairs. If it isn't, it will be. Say, did you know, Lieutenant, they just did a new soundproofing job down there. Yeah, man could yell his lungs out and nobody would ever hear him. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait oh, a minute. That's so. How nice. Uh, what do you say we test the soundproofing with little Richard here? No, 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 you can't. It's against the law. <laughs> Listen to who's talking now, Stone. <laughs> against the law, huh? Well, well, well. Can, uh, can, uh, could I make a deal? What kind? Well, maybe, uh, maybe you drop the arm part of the charge. What for? Will you? Will you? Let's see the size of your merchandise. It's, uh, it's the gang that pulled the Rosedale manor job. The Rosedale job? You in on that? No, 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 not me. But I went to a party. They were celebrating, see? Jackie Benson, Betty Page, Joey the Dip Waters, even Louis Fagan Keller, the fence. You see, they, uh, that is Joey, he had a few too many, see? I got the whole layer. Is it a deal, Lieutenant? Is it? Patty, I want to see your new coat. On or off, Lieutenant? Ah, save it for the suckers out front, Patty. Where's the coat? In the closet. And I paid good, honest money for that coat. Yeah, sure, sure. The money was honest, but how about the man who sold it to you? How about Louis Keller? Uh, is this it? Yeah, that's it. What are you doing? Hey, stop it! You're ruining the comb. You got no Shut right to up, do Patty. It. But... This is stolen goods, and you know it. See, yeah, here's the furrier's code mark. Is it the what? Furrier's code on the skins under the lining, good as fingerprints. You don't mind if I borrow your sables for a few days, do you, Patty? I'll give you a receipt. <laughs> Well, Mr. Leopold? But of course, of course it is my coat. I know it even without the markings. Whose is it? Mrs. Williams. Louise Williams. For her I made it. Special. I matched the skins like no other coat in the world. You keep a record that'll stand up in court. But of course, always, you know that, Lieutenant. Yes, Mrs. Barton, we got our break. We found Mrs. Williams' coat. Oh, Louise will be delighted. No more than I am, Lieutenant. I'm sure you are. Now then, Mrs. Barton, we'll get all the coats back if you'll cooperate with us. But what can I do? You have a lot of friends, Mrs. Barton. Do you think one of them would go so far as to arrange a benefit affair like yours? Say, uh, 
Someone who lives about ten miles away from you, Mrs. Barton? Not bad. Definitely not bad. How much do you suppose this one's worth, Betty? Not much. About three G's. They're better ones. Where's Joey? You whistled for him five minutes ago. It's a different layout here. What's eating you? I don't know. I just don't like the feeling around here. For the love of Mike, the girl's getting sensitive. Sensitive? Didn't you notice who's here? Where's Joey? Be along in a minute. Who's here? Mrs. Barton and the Williams Dane. Oh, so that's why you ducked behind the racks and let me check them. They'd remember a woman. All right, it's all right. They didn't see you. There's Joey. He's not picking kids. Here they come. Okay, Betty. Here's, here's three for a while. I'll get some more. All right. Now watch it, Joe. Hey, Betty, that's not Joe at the car. No, it's not, Benson. Car! None of that. There's no exit for you, Benson. I told her we couldn't pull the same stunt twice. Where's the dame? Betty! The dame's friend, Lieutenant. What? She came out from behind the coat racks with a gun. Got out the door before we could grab her. Now, we'll get her. You take care of this monkey while I get out the alarm. <laughs> Had a good hunch, Stone. Restroom covered. Inside and out, Lieutenant. Check. Let's go. Pardon me, miss. Uh, you're Betty Page, aren't you? Sorry. I'm afraid you've made a mistake. I'm not... Yes, gonna... you are. The young man over there says so. His name is Jack Benson. Jack Benson? A bull of filthy rotten. Oh, no. You can't blame a man for finding his way out of a long-term rap. I can blame you? a man for anything. Got a gun, Lieutenant. Let's drop it. Dirty oh. rotten. Stoy! Ladies, don't play with guns. Not around me, anyway. You didn't have to break my wrist. You didn't have to. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about that. You'll have plenty of time to heal where you're going. Crime does not pay. who has starred as Betty Page in Clothes Make the Woman, will be back with you in just a moment. Now, here in person is Jean Muir. To me, the most interesting side of the character of Betty Page is her background, a part of her which, unfortunately, there's no time to dwell on at length. Invariably, though, girls like Betty Page reached and passed a point in their lives where they were denied the nice things they saw other girls have, through no fault of their own, and denied, too, the means to get those things honestly. With a good education, the job of the future, Betty would have become a useful citizen. Her mind, and she had a good one, would then have worked for, not against, society. It follows, then, that the fundamental causes of Betty's career in crime lie at the door of society as a whole. It is up to us, the everyday citizens, to understand those causes and to destroy them, because for us, as well as for the Betty Pages of this world, crime does not pay. Thank you, Jean Muir. Crime Does Not Pay is written by Ira Marion and directed by Mark B. Lowe, with music composed and conducted by John Gart. Technical advisor is Burton B. Turtis. The events, characters, and names used in the story you've just heard are fictitious. Any similarity is purely coincidental. This, I believe. Knowledge is power. A nation is no stronger than the educational system it supports. 
Sometimes we allow ourselves to be tricked by the notion that our material wealth is our strength. Then, in times like these, we come to realize that our real fortitude depends on how deep we mine the minds of men for courage and human understanding. Robert Arthur Evans is a football player, a star tackle for the University of Pennsylvania, but he is something else. Son of a vegetable checker in a chain grocery store and a product of Philadelphia schools, Bob Evans is an example of the richness in human resources which these United States possess. Here's what he's come to believe so far. Does it really matter what one person believes? I think it does. Just as I believe that every single individual can be of great influence for evil or for good in the community in which he lives. I firmly believe in the dignity of every individual created to the image and likeness of his maker and endowed by his creator with inherent sacred rights. But every individual who possesses these rights also has responsibilities. He has duties. No man lives for himself. He has duties to himself, to his fellow men, and to his God. I believe that every individual must have self-respect if he would have others respect him. He must believe in himself. He must have confidence in himself if he would have others have confidence in him. I believe in the basic equality of all men, regardless of their race, their creed, or their national origin. But I also believe that the same Creator who made us equal endowed us with unequal talents. It is my conviction that although not every American at this time practices the great American creed of equality, the time will come when fair-minded citizens will take every man for what he is if he can prove to them that individually he is a person of genuine worth and worthy of respect. As a youngster, I used to watch football teams line up and play the game. It was nothing more to me than one team winning and the other losing. Later on, when I became an actual participant, I saw that there was more to it all. There was competition of the right sort. There was skill and all the hard practice that made for skill. There was fellowship and there was the will to win. There was the thrill of victory, the thrill of achievement. And I think that life is something like that when the game is played right. No matter what a person's endowments may be, it is up to him to use his God-given talents to the very best of his ability. It is part of his responsibility to himself, his fellow men, and to his maker. Anything that is worth having should be worth working for. And I thank God that I live in a country where anyone, regardless of his humble beginnings, can set his sights high and then work with all his might toward a worthwhile goal with all his strength and all his talents. Over-reliance on self, however, is a dangerous thing when we have the notion that we are everything. I believe that religion should play a vital part in everyone's life. The recognition of one's maker and one's final judge must be part and parcel of life if it is to have any real and true meaning and the Ten Commandments must be indispensable cornerstones in any building we might call success. We must work as if all depended on ourselves, even if we know that in the last analysis it all depends on God. This I believe. This I firmly believe. That was the University of Pennsylvania's 1952 varsity football captain, star Negro and Bob Evans. In 1959, if all goes well, he'll be Robert Arthur Evans, M.D., and we believe a valuable citizen. Calling all detectives. When a girl broke a string of imitation pearls, she started a string of events that led straight to a prison cell. That is the situation on this page from my casebook. The Casebook of Jerry Browning, Private Detective. Even a private detective like me, Jerry Browning, once in a while gets the brakes. I ducked out of the rain into the Hamilton Building Arcade. The brightly lighted shops lining both sides of the first floor were a welcome contrast to the heavy weather outside. I turned away from one of the shop windows and saw something even more attractive. A nice-looking little blonde walking through the lobby. Just then... 
and a girl jumped at the sound of the thunder. And a moment later, she was scrambling after a string of beads that had been around her neck and were now scattered all over the lobby floor. I bent down to help her pick them up, noticed what I thought were beads actually were pearls. The girl was agitated, not because the pearls were valuable, but because her fiancé had given her the necklace. She was on her way to meet him now and simply had to be wearing those pearls. Nothing to worry about, miss. There's a good jeweler on the other side of the Hamilton Arcade, Barton and Holdsworth. Here's my card. Give it to Sam Barton. He's an old friend of mine. He'll have those pearls restrung for you in ten minutes. The rain was letting up a bit, so I went on out about my business. I got back to my office about an hour and a half later, found a message to call the jeweler Sam Barton. Very urgent. What Sam told me made me hang up the phone fast, jump into my car. The blonde who'd broken the string of pearls was still in Sam's shop and crying. There was also a big, good-looking young guy who was trying to comfort her, and who I gathered was her fiancé. Also, there were two cops in uniform. What's this all about, Sam? I send a girl in here to get some imitation pearls restrung, and you tell me they're worth $30,000. Sam winced. I'm sorry, Jerry, but that's how it is. That's a string of matched genuine pearls, and they tally exactly with the description of the pearls stolen from the Wentworth collection. When I sent a girl to a store to have a cheap necklace restrung, the imitation pearls turned out to be genuine and stolen. The girl's name was Jean Martin. Her fiancé, who had given her the necklace, was Steve Conway, and they were both practically speechless with fear. Now look, Sam, let's find out what this is all about. I turned to Conway. Just tell us how you happened to get the pearls, and you won't have anything to worry about. Well, I found the pearls, Mr. Browning. I, I know I should have reported it, but I didn't think they were valuable. They looked like such a nice present for Jean. Oh, when old Grover Wentworth hears about this, I'll really be in a jam. Wait a minute. Do you know Mr. Wentworth? Certainly. He and my father used to be partners. When my father died, Mr. Wentworth put me through college and just last week got me an offer of an engineering job in South America. I turned it down because I wanted to be here with Jeannie. He smiled at the girl who shyly smiled back. I grinned, too. Well, it's quite a coincidence, you finding Mr. Wentworth's pearls, but... Since you know him, we should get this straightened out in no time. Let's go see him. One of the cops spoke up. He ain't going no place except to headquarters, Mr. Browning. This is stolen stuff. That's all right, officer. I'll be personally responsible for Mr. Conway. It took 30 minutes waiting and explaining to three secretaries before we got in to see Wentworth. And when we did... This is most embarrassing, Mr. Browning... Young Conway was a guest at my home the evening the pearls disappeared. Of course, I don't doubt that he found them, but... Well, I reported the loss to the police and to the insurance company. Okay, tell the insurance company the stuff has been recovered. Then we'll go to work and find out what really happened. Well, all I can tell you is that I found him in an envelope on the street, a little way from Mr. Wentworth's house. Keep quiet. What do you say, Mr. Wentworth? I'm sorry, Mr. Browning. The thing is out of my hands. I've been paid the value of the pearls by the insurance company. You'll have to deal with them. Wentworth's insurance was placed with Transocean Insurance Company. And at their office, Henry Pickett, in charge of investigations, told us that Conway here, one of Mr. Wentworth's guests, found the pearls is a coincidence I cannot accept. Frankly, I think Conway stole them. Which means you intend to prosecute? We most certainly will. And unless you wish to become seriously involved, you'd better turn Conway over to the police. Well, I took the kid over to the police. Tried not to see the accusing look his girl gave me. Coincidence. The more I thought about it, the less I believed it. But I still didn't think Conway was a thief. He didn't figure to be one. At the downtown securities exchange office, I began a check through investment ownership files for the past eight years. It took me three days, but what I found led me to the office of the corporate counsel. What I was looking for were the records going back to the date when Conway, Wentworth, and company were formed. What I found led me to an interview with young Conway and his cell. Steve, if Wentworth is such a rich man... How come that when your father died, there wasn't even enough money to send you through college? I understand the firm wasn't doing well at that time. Wentworth didn't start making money until a few years later. <laughs> oh, that's what you think. I 
I barged past Wentworth's three secretaries and into his private office. Mr. Browning, uh, I've been thinking. I'll take the pearls back, return the insurance money so Conway won't be prosecuted. You know that wouldn't stop prosecution. And speaking of giving back, how about giving him back the money you stole from his father? Wentworth's face drained of color. Scared? You ought to be. No wonder you were so good to the kid. Kept him away at school, found him a job in South America. Anything to keep him from staying around here and getting curious. And when he wouldn't leave the country, you put those pearls where he'd be bound to find them and bound to land in jail. Wentworth, I have here a warrant for your arrest. You're charged with defrauding an estate. That's all there was to it. We had him so completely nailed on a fraud charge that the business about the pearls was secondary. The insurance company withdrew that charge against Conway fast, happy to avoid a false arrest suit. Conway's a rich man today. He and Jeannie are married. For a wedding gift, I sent them... Yeah, a string of pearls. Guaranteed imitation. Like I said, a man doesn't need wealth if he has the pearl of integrity. Listen next time to Calling All Detectives. Mystery drama, mystery quiz... And a chance for you to match wits with yours truly, Jerry Browning, Private Detective. Chicken turning out to be a rooster all of a sudden. <laughs> Cock a doodle doo. <laughs> Cock a doodle. Uh, in case anybody here is interested, from here on in, the name is just plain Charlie Nix. <laughs> Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears, the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gap open and death strikes. How? You learn the answer in just a minute in Trigger Man. <laughs> of mystery and terror by radio's foremost mystery writers. Our story, written by Max Ehrlich, is different from any of the other tales you have heard in this program. Its mystery is not that of the supernatural, but of the unknown quantities in the human soul. And so, because it has suspense and complete credibility, we give you Trigger Man. At the door? No. No, not yet. Not that it matters. You can't get very far with a slug in your guts. But I can sit here. And when I come through that door, I'll show them what Chicken Charlie Nix can do with a gun. Sure. Maybe it'll be for the last time. But what can I lose now? funny how it all comes back to you in the end. Just a year and a half, though, that it all started. But I remember it like it was yesterday. I was standing back in the doorway waiting, waiting for some sucker to come along. It was down at the waterfront and it was plenty dark. I stood there, the rod cold in my hand, waiting. Finally, I heard footsteps. A man and a woman. I waited until they were almost opposite the doorway, and then... Hey, buddy. Got a match? Why, yes, I think so. Never mind. Get your dukes up. Tell him he's got a gun. Oh, stick up, huh? Aren't you smart, sucker? Come on, reach. Get those hands up before I let you have it. Yeah. It's better. Okay, lady, let's begin with you. What did I... Hand over that purse. Better do as he says, man. 
All right, Dylan. Thanks, lady. Thanks very much. Okay, buddy, let's have your wallet. I said come across with your wallet. Not tonight, chicken. What do you mean? Hey, wait a minute. How come you know my name? It's my job to know it. In your face, too. The name's Riley. From headquarters. Tom Riley. Plain clothes. Yeah. Keep up those hands. Keep them up or I'll twist it. I don't know you won't, chicken. Tom. Not for a lot more than I've got in my wallet. Tom, what are you doing? He'll kill you. I don't think he will. Will you, chicken? Keep away from the plant, but don't come a step near you, here. Another step and I'll splatter you all over the sidewalk. You haven't got the nerve, chicken. You know it and I know it. Now, drop that gun. Keep away, keep away, do you hear? I ain't afraid to shoot. I'll tell you, I'll let you have it. Then what are you waiting for? Wait a minute. That was for the gun, chicken. And this is for you. No. Call me up. No, no, you yellow belly rat. Pull the gun on me, will you? Oh, John. It's okay, Ann. It's all over. You could have been killed walking straight into a hold-up man and knocking the gun out of his hand. Well, I knew he wouldn't shoot him. You know, You know? But how? His name is Charlie Nix. Chicken Charlie. Oh, he... oh, he carries a gun, yeah, but he's not a gunman. Because he's never used it and he never will. Just plain chicken-hearted. Yellow. That's why they call him Chicken. Still... Still, you took an awful chance, Tom. There's always the first time. <laughs> Not for Chicken Charlie. Now, then, you see if you can find a phone, honey, and call headquarters okay. while I keep an eye on this yellow skunk here. Yeah, that's the way it was. I just didn't have the nerve to put the blast on anyone. Sometimes in my room, I'd put my gun on a table and just look at it. I keep thinking... If he only had the nerve, I'd be one of Angelo Dinelli's trigger men instead of his errand boy. The rest of the mob would respect me instead of slap me around and call me chicken. That's what got me more than anything else, the way they laughed and called me chicken. It wasn't that I didn't try. That time I held up Riley, I was going to let him have it. I wanted to, but I don't know, at the last minute I got all cold inside. And my fingers got stiff and numb. And it cost me a year and a pen. The day after I got out, I was sitting in the Boulevard Cafe, had myself a beer, when in walked the boss, Angie Benelli. It's great having you back, chicken. Thanks, Angie. Thanks. By the way, I saw an old pal of yours the other day. Yeah? Who? Tom Riley. Riley, huh? Yeah, it's too bad you didn't knock him off that night, chicken. Yeah. But one of these days, Angie, I'm going to meet him, and then I'll... Oh, kid, I know how you feel. After all, when a guy takes your gun away, makes you look like a chump. Yeah, he made me look like a chump, all right. But I'm different now, Angie. That you're in a clink, well, I, I got a different kind of nerve now. Wait and see. Sure, gonna... sure, but take it easy, kid. There's plenty of time, plenty. You just got out of stir, and you got yourself to worry about. What do you mean, Angie? I... Did my time tonight? I'm in the clear. Sure, chicken, sure. But if you ask me, the pen didn't do you any good, you. Well, you look kind of all in. You don't feel so good, do you? What? What makes you say that, Angie? Oh, I don't know. Your face ain't got any color and you're breathing hard all the time. Well, I... I feel okay. Sure. I ain't saying anything's wrong with you, chicken. But you never can tell until a good doc checks you over, huh? Yeah. Maybe you're right, Angie. Maybe... Maybe I ought to see it, doctor, huh? Now you're talking sense, kid. Tell you what I'll do. I'll take you to my own doctor, Dr. Leonard. He's a big specialist, and he'll give you the once-over right. Yeah, yeah, but he... He probably comes high. Forget it, it, chicken. Forget it. I'll take care of it. Won't cost you a dime. Hey, that's pretty white of me, Angie. <laughs> Think nothing of it, kid. After all, you're one of my boys, ain't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, if there's one thing Angie Donnelly does, it's to take care of his boys. A 
couple of days later, Angie Dinelli set up an appointment for me with this Dr. Leonard. I went to his office and he gave me a real checkup from soup to nuts. And when he got through, I... Well, I didn't like the look on his face. Sit down, Mr. Nix, and uh, let's talk. Doc, what's the matter? Did you find something wrong? <clears throat> Care for a cigarette? Never mind, Mr. Stolen. Doc, give it to me straight. Is it good or bad? I'm sorry, but it's bad. You mean my, my chest? It isn't your chest. It's your heart. My, my heart? What about it? Now, you've got a severe aneurysm there. A what? What's that mean? Yeah, it means that you've got a serious weakness of the heart muscle wall. Yeah, yeah, but how serious? I'm sorry, Mr. Nix, but you haven't got more than six months to live. Six months. Yeah, that's what he said. Six months to live. For a while, I didn't get it. You don't get things like that right away. And then... Six months, and... He gave me six months to live. Someday I'll be just walking along and maybe sleeping, and then it'll... It'll come. It's tough, chicken. Plenty tough. Yeah. I know how you feel. Nobody knows how I feel. Except maybe a guy in a death house. Yeah. That's what it's like. Like knowing when you're going to burn, waiting for it. Take it easy, chicken. Yeah. Have another drink. Huh? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Andy. You're, you're okay. Okay. Maybe the doc was wrong. There's always a chance. No, no, Angie. He checked me twice just to make sure. There ain't a thing I can do, not a thing except wait for it. Just sit around and wait to croak. Listen, kid. You've got six months to live. Okay. You know what I'd do if I had six months to live? What? What would you do? I'd live. Huh? Yeah, I'd spend all my time living. Champagne, dames, I'd have more. I'd do all the things I ever wanted to do, but didn't have the nerve to do before. You see what I mean, kid? I'd live a lifetime in six months. Sure, sure, but that takes dough. You can get the dough? How? Oh, from me. Huh? Look, chicken... You always wanted to be a trigger man, didn't you? Yeah. Well, I am hiring you right here and now. At 500 a week. 500? But, Angie, you know I ain't got the nerve. Sure you have, but it's different now. You don't have to be afraid of a thing. Not a thing. Well, you can go around blasting guys like clay pigeons if you want to. But suppose the cops... Yeah, what do you care? Suppose they send you to the death house. You got nothing to lose anyway, have you? Your heart's bad, ain't it? You've only got a little while anyway, either way. Yeah. That's right, Angie. That's right. What can I lose? Then Ellie was right. This was my chance. I packed a new gap and started to look for Riley. Riley, the dick who'd set me up. Yeah. He was going to be number one. <laughs> He'll be coming along here any minute, kid. Yeah, yeah. This is it, chicken. There's Riley. There he is. No, chicken, not yet. Wait till he comes closer. Look, Angie, the hey, first one that comes hardest, kid, the rest are easy. <laughs> Look at him, pal. He knows from nothing. Take your beat on him. You can't miss. Okay, chicken, go ahead. Let him have it. Go ahead, bless him. <laughs> you did it, you did it, kid. Yeah, I, I guess I did it. Flat on the sidewalk, colder than yesterday's hash. You did it, Charlie. Henry, I... I you... You just called me... Charlie. Sure, kid, why not? You're not chicken anymore. Now, maybe we better get out of here. away up the street, leaving the body lying there in a pool of blood as the clock strikes twelve for murder at midnight. <laughs> Now, back to Murder at Midnight, 
to the story of Trigger Man. Where are they anyway? I'm getting kind of anxious to see them. Even, even with a slug in my gut, I'll be able to give them quite a reception. Funny how a guy can change. How different it's all been since I put the blast on Riley. That was my first and the toughest one. After that, it was easy. There were plenty of guys in Angie Danelli's way, and I aimed to please. Whenever I watched one of them fold up with that funny expression on his face, why, it kind of helped. It helped me to forget how it was with me. It was like a champagne drunk. But then the hangover would come, and... I'd remember that I had less than six months to live myself. Yeah, I was a different guy, all right. Take what happened a couple of days after I got Riley. We was having a meeting up at the hideaway and a new job when a character named Bummy Devine started shooting his mouth off. Hey, chicken. Still carrying around that pup gun of yours? What did you call me? Chicken. Ain't that your name? The name is Charlie. Charlie Nix. <laughs> hey, guys. Yeah, yeah. What do you know? Chicken's turning out to be a rooster all of a sudden. Cock a doodle doo. <laughs> Cock a doodle. -doo. <laughs> in case anybody else here is interested, the name from here in is just plain Charlie Nix. <laughs> he didn't laugh at the net. No one did again, ever. I was it. I took chances where no other trigger man would. Why not? What'd I have to lose? A few months, I'd be through anyway. There was a difference. Meanwhile, I lived. I painted the town red. Bought myself tailored suits. Hit the clubs every night. The gambling joints. <laughs> and the dames. Why, well, I had to fight them off. You can do a lot with 500 bucks a week. Sure, I was hot. Plenty hot. The cops couldn't figure out at the beginning who was doing all the fancy gun work, but they were getting warm, and they were getting close. I had to watch myself. And then one night, they were knocking off a fur warehouse. I was in the lookout car out front when suddenly... Hey, Charlie! A prowl car! Yeah, come on, Mike. Let's get out of here. They're shooting at us! Tommy guns! Hang on, Charlie. Here they come right after us. Hold it steady, Mike. I'm going to try to nail a tire. Hey, Charlie. Charlie, what's the matter? Uh, I'm hit. Keep, keep going, Mike. Got a ditch in my... I... Hold up. Oh. <laughs> Opened my eyes, there was a smell of chloroform. And the doctor was just putting away some instruments. Mike was there, too, with a gap in his hand, making sure that the doc would cooperate. Hello, Charlie. How do you feel? I, I don't know. What happened? The doc here just dug a slug out of your chest. Oh. How am I, how am I doing, doc? You'll be all right. Lucky you've got a good heart. Otherwise, you'd never have made it. What? Did, did you say my heart was good? That's right. But I don't get it. I, I thought I had a bad tick. They told me I didn't have more than a few months to live. <laughs> With that heart, my friend, you can live to be a hundred. That is, if the police don't interfere. <laughs> I spent three weeks late up after that in bed. And every day the boss would send me flowers, comic books, and all kinds of stuff. A real thoughtful guy, Angie. But I was thoughtful, too. There were some things I had to add up for myself. I had to find out whether I was living on borrowed time or not. As soon as I could walk, I made a beeline for Angie Donnelly's specialist, Doc Leonard. But I found out right away that Doc Leonard didn't live there anymore. A dentist was in the office instead. Then I looked up the superintendent. Yes, I'm in charge here. 
What can I do for you? If it's a body It isn't. Part. I'm looking for Dr. Leonard. Dr. Leonard? Oh, the one that was in the dentist's office before. That's right. You know where he went? No, he didn't leave any forwarding address. It's a funny thing about him. Yeah? Why? Why, he paid us a month's rent in advance and moved in, equipment and everything. But he only stayed two days. Moved out at night. No notice, nothing. Just came and went. I see. Never could figure it out. That's the way it was. Sorry, I couldn't be of more help, mister. That's okay. You've told me enough. All I want to know. So that was it. I had the answer. I went home, took my old gun out of the drawer, slipped it into my shoulder holster. Felt good there. Just like old times. I was just putting on my hat and coat on the phone. Hello. Hello, Charlie. How are you feeling? Fine, Angie. Fine. Funny thing you calling up just now. Yeah, why? I was just thinking of you. Where are you now? feel fine, fine. Yes, well, rub over to my place right away. Okay, I'll be right over. And, Angie. Yeah? Thanks for everything. For the flowers and stuff. <laughs> Forget it, kid. What's a pal for, anyway? Funny how a guy acts sometimes. I remember in the cab on the way over, I was like ice. Cold inside and out. I should have been excited, but I wasn't. I came up to Angie's apartment and knocked on the door. Yeah, who is it? Me, Charlie. Oh, okay. Morning, Charlie. Yeah, thanks. Well, you're up and around, huh, kid? It's great, great. Yep, not that it makes much difference. You see, Angie, my six months is supposed to be up tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. You know something, Angie? I feel fine, fine. And yet, I'm supposed to croak. Well, it's just like I said, kid. Maybe Doc Leonard was wrong. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Maybe he was wrong, you know, made a mistake. Sure. So, this afternoon, I went up to see him. You... You did, huh? Yeah, yeah. And you know what, Angie? He doesn't live there anymore. No. In fact, he only set up practice there a couple of days. Kind of set me to wondering. Uh-huh. Wondering, uh... What? Whether this Doc Leonard wasn't a doctor after all, but just a phony. I, uh, I don't get it. Why, uh, why should he be? Suppose you tell me, Angie. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know what you mean. Oh? Uh-huh. And suppose I tell you, Angie. This Doc Leonard was your boy. Between you, you framed me with this bad heart gag. You needed a gunster who could take chances and... I was your pigeon. Wait a minute, Charlie. I've it was easy, it. wasn't it, then, Ellie? Talking a chump like me into it. When I thought I only had six months to go. You knew I wouldn't be afraid anymore. Sure. What could I lose? And so you got me to do your dirty work for you while you were somewhere else with an airtight alibi. And when the heat was turned on, you knew it'd be on me. <laughs> You're wrong, kid. You see, you were supposed to live six months... And that's all you're going to do. Don't do any reaching, Angie. Don't! You, you taught me how to use a gun, Angie. You should have just let me stay. Chicken Charlie Nix. Yeah. Yeah, he got me in the belly with his first one. But I got him before he could repeat. There he is. Lying on his own rug, soaking in his blood. That's for me. Well, there ain't much I can do but wait. Somebody must have heard the shots, called the cops. Funny how I feel now. How different it is. When you think of it, if I'd stayed Chicken Charlie, I wouldn't be here now with a slug in my guts. Like the doc said, I could have lived to be maybe a hundred. Well, if it ain't old Chicken Charlie. Hello, copper. What did you call me? 
Why, we've been looking all over for you, chicken. But it looks like somebody saved the state some gold. Not yet. I've still got enough stuff to stay away of. Don't come any closer, you hear? No? Why not, chicken? Because I'm a killer, that's why. Because I got nothing to live for anyway. Keep away from me, you hear? Keep away from Oh, what? Give me that rod. I'm a stop, you can't. Sure, I can punch. Once a chicken, always a chicken. <laughs> Eyes wide and incredulous, the hunched figure slips from the deep armchair, falls to the floor, next to the body of the man he killed. And somewhere in the distance, a clock in a church steeple starts chiming for murder at midnight. <laughs> Charlie Nix was played by Bill Quinn. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight is directed by Anton M. Leader. I believe. Major General Robert B. McClure is the commanding general of the U.S. Army's 6th Infantry Division at Fort Ord, California. A native of Rome, Georgia, he is a Far Eastern military expert who is a veteran of both World Wars and Korea. During World War II, he served in the South Pacific and then was the commander of all U.S. Army ground forces in the China Theater. After the war, he was chief of staff of the 2nd Army. Later, he commanded the 2nd Infantry Division in Korea. Here now is the creed of General McClure. I believe in the warmth and unselfishness of people. Throughout history, people have given their lives that others might have a better world in which to live. Thousands daily donate their blood to assist strangers to hold on to life. A community turns out to assist a neighbor whose house is burned to the ground. A little boy takes off his sweater to protect his dog from a chilling rain. A rugged policeman sneaks a basket of groceries to a poor old lady on his beat. A trainman never fails to wave at children hanging over a fence on some remote ranch or farm. You all know what I mean. People are constantly giving of themselves to bring some measure of happiness, comfort, and security to others. I believe in honoring people during their lifetime on earth, as well as due veneration when they depart from us. I also believe in discipline, and throughout my military life, have explained to all officers and men that discipline means consideration of others and instant and cheerful obedience to lawfully constituted authority. I believe that the best in all of us is brought out through discipline. The loving guidance of parents, the kindly guidance of teachers, ministers, friends, and public servants, but most important of all, self-discipline. I believe, and it has become a slogan in my command, that a wise man learns from experience, but a wiser man learns from the experience of others. I try to follow this precept in my daily activities and learn something new every day.
Leadership is as enduring as nature, and much can be gained from studying the lives of successful people of the past. However, personal adversity, sorrow, frustration, and disappointment can make me a better man if I am wise enough and strong enough to learn from these experiences. Young people should be encouraged and given full freedom in determining their futures and permitted to think for themselves. Parents can advise, assist, and support in many things, but the best a child can hope to inherit from parents is a sound body and a reasonably intelligent mind. I believe in the greatness of simplicity and the simplicity of greatness. The most outstanding men I know are simple, direct, modest, and humble. I have found the martinet on the stuffed shirt to be mediocre, selfish, and egotistical. Abraham Lincoln is, in my opinion, the greatest American of all time. He has affected me more than any other individual. This simple man who led our nation in its darkest days refused to compromise the principles he so sincerely believed. Like Lincoln, I believe that a sense of humor is essential to a proper mental balance. We need more Abraham Lincolns in this world today. Largely because of his influence, I believe in the dignity of man. I believe that people throughout the world are essentially decent and desire to live on peaceful terms with one another. I greatly prefer a positive to a negative approach to our present problems, and I do not believe that life today is abnormal, tragic, chaotic, or impossible of solution. And finally, I believe in God, but no particular creed. No one who has observed that most men die with a reference to God on their lips can doubt the existence of a supreme being. That was Major General Robert McClure, a combat veteran of three wars, who is now at Fort Ord, California. for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, An Angle on Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mutilated Foot. I wanted to hear the recorded confession you made of that mad murderer who killed his wife. I didn't think I'd have to listen to it in the dark. Well, that's the way we got him to confess in the first place. Oh, I'll take it, Betsy. Okay, Nick. Nick Carter's office. Uh, I'd like to talk to Mr. Nicholas Carter. This is Nick Carter speaking. Oh, hello, Nick. This is John Hamill, the banker's associates. Oh, hello, John. How have you been? Nick, I'm in trouble. I can't discuss it over the phone. How soon can you meet me? Where? On West Street, around the corner from the Greystone Building, where my offices are. Please get there as fast as you can. All right, John. I'll be there in ten minutes. Thank you. Now, Stubby, you understand exactly what you're to do? Yeah, Nick. Okay. I'll see you later. I've got a date on this corner. Okay, Nick. I'll be seeing you. Hey, look at that car coming up the street, would you? Hey, Nick, watch out! That car is coming right up! Oh, oh. Did he hit you, Nick? Are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Oh, gee, that was close. It almost seemed like whoever was driving that car did that on purpose. Wouldn't be at all surprised, Cubby. I think somebody is interested in preventing me from keeping my appointment. Hey, look, maybe I'd better stay with you, Nick. No, I've got something else for you to do, Cubby. I got the number of that car. Hop down to the license bureau and find out who it belongs to. Then wait for me at the office. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so Oh, hello, John. I've been on this corner waiting for you for 20 minutes. Where have you been? Trying to get here without anyone seeing me. Well, why all the mystery? What's up? Wait a minute, Nick. Here. Get back in this doorway, quick. Don't let him see us. Well, 
Who was that? Somebody trailing you? I don't know. I never saw him before. Is that why you want to dodge him? You haven't done anything wrong, have you? No, Nick. Absolutely nothing. Now listen. I don't want the police in on this just yet, if I can help it. A banking firm like mine can't stand any unnecessary notoriety. Well, yes, I know, John, but what's this all about? Well, let me explain. I wanted to tell you out here where I can be sure no one will hear us. You see, Nick, several days ago I discovered there's a serious shortage on our books. Somebody has been taking money from the accounts, and I'm almost, almost sure I know who it is. I've called a meeting of my four partners. They're upstairs in my office waiting for me right now to have a showdown before their stockholders find out. That's why I ask you to come over here, Nick. You may have to make an arrest tonight. Well, you don't want a detective, John. You want a cop. No, no, no. You're wrong, Nick. I want you. Please come along. Well, perhaps you better wait down the lobby while I go up and see if everything's all right. That is safe for you to come. No, on. no, Nick. There's no need for that. All right. I want to be in on the showdown. Come on. Anything you say. And if you really feel that something dangerous is in the wind, I think I should go up there first and look around. And if everything's okay, let you know. No, no. I want to go up now and get it over with. Well, you insist. I do, Nick. Oh, I know it's pretty late, but I waited purposely till the offices were closed to avoid any publicity. This whole business requires the greatest secrecy. Pipe off long. Oh, this is our floor, Nick. After you, John. Oh, thank you. Kind of dark in this hallway, isn't it? Yes, the lighting isn't any too good here, but... John! John! John, are you hurt bad? Uh, quiet, please, quiet. Gentlemen, John Hamill is dead. John oh, Hamill is dead, but that's terrible, oh, terrible. How did it happen? That's what I want to know. You seem to know him. Who are you? Well, I could ask you the same question. Who are you? I'm Nick Carter. Nick Carter, the detective? Yes. Oh, well, my name's Tom Burdick. I'm one of Hamill's partners, and uh, uh, these are the others. Uh, Mr. Carter, I'm Emil Garrick, and this is Arthur Nelson and Alan Cornish. How do you do, Mr. Carter? You're Cornish, huh? Yes, Mr. Carter. What do you know about this? Nothing, nothing. I I was in my office all the time. Well, that's not true, Cornish. I saw you go out in the hall just a few seconds before Hamill was shot. That right, Cornish? Yes, I... I did go out for a moment. But when the shot was fired, I was back in my office. But why question me? Why don't you ask Burdick where he was, the Nelson mechanic? Well, I can easily explain where Mr. Nelson and I were. We were both together in my office preparing some papers for tonight's meeting. That's right, Mr. Carter. I was with Mr. Garrick. Which of you men belong to which office? Well, you can see the layout yourself, Mr. Carter. They all open off this L-shaped corridor. First comes Nelson's office, then Burdick's. There, on the long leg of the L. Then on the corner at the end is Cornish's office, directly in line with the corridor to the elevator. And Garrick's office is around the corner on the short leg of the L. That's right. Hmm. That's out of sight of the elevator completely, isn't it? Sure. You can't even see the corridor from my office. So I see. Then, Cornish, your office is the only one which faces the corridor. I'd like to have a look at it. All right. This way. This is my office, Mr. Carter. Hmm. Peculiar order, yeah? Let's see. Well, what are we here in this umbrella stand? A gun. A one oh, And it's been fired very recently. I should say, gentlemen, this was the murder weapon. That's Mr. Cornish's umbrella stand. What do you know about this, Cornish? I don't know anything about it. But that gun belongs to Mr. Cornish. That's right, Mr. Carter. I've seen it in his desk many times. I recognize that fancy handle. Say, what are you fellows trying to do? We're sure it's my gun. But I haven't seen it for three days. Someone stole it on my desk, Mr. Carter. Why didn't you report it to the police? Because I... I didn't carry a permit for it. I was afraid of getting in trouble. Cornish, I regret that appearances are against you. I'm afraid I'll have to turn you over to the police. You won't turn me over to the police! Well, what happened to the light? Cornish, turn them out! Turn those lights on! Stop, 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 See, Patsy, I was right with Hammer when he was murdered. What I can't figure out was how he was shot when there was no one else in the hall with us. Don't ask me, Nick. And here's something else. I heard only one shot fired. But Cornish's gun had three empty shells. And to top it all off, here's the bullet that killed Hamill. The coroner gave it to me. Notice how it's all banged up? Yes. How did that happen? I wish I knew. Patsy, if I knew the answer to that, I think I'd know the answer to this whole case. Until we find Cornish. 
Oh, I'll get it. Hello, Carter? Yes, this is Nick Carter. Oh, this is Alan Cornish. I... I suppose I'm a fool for calling Bob Carter, but I need help. I'm desperate and I can't go to the police. You've got to help me prove I didn't kill him. Why'd you run away, Cornish? Because I was scared. Lucky for me you didn't hit me. Don't worry, Cornish. If I'd really wanted to hit you, I would have. Where are you now? I'll tell you, but you've got to promise to come alone. If you don't... The only thing I'll promise you is that I won't do anything to have to talk to you. Now, what's the address? 1813 Oak Street. Come right over. I'll be waiting for you. Okay, sit tight. I'll be there. You mean we'll be there. I'm sick of sitting around here. I'm going with you. Oak Street. This is it, Betsy. Gosh, what a creepy-looking place. Uh, certainly not very attractive. Well, come on, let's go in. Maybe he's not here. He said he'd be here. Wonder if... It... Well, the door is open. Should we go in? We can't keep our date with Cornish if we don't. Gosh, it's dark in here. Nick, do you suppose it could be a trap? Never can be quite sure, Patsy. Here's the door. Stand behind me. Do you see anything in there, Nick? Wait till I get my flashlight. No. Looks deserted. Oh, come on. Let's try another room. Gee, this place gives me the jitters. Practically deserted. Maybe he's in here. Stand back, Patsy. Maybe he got scared after he called you and slipped away. We'll soon find out. There's another door. Over there. <gasps> Look, Nick. Is that... Yes. He's hanged himself. <laughs> came back to the office again tonight. Cornish is dead. I guess that closes the case. Patsy, I'm not satisfied. When I talked to him on the phone, he certainly didn't sound like a man who was going to kill himself. When a man wants to prove himself innocent, he doesn't commit suicide. No, Patsy, there's something about that hanging that's bothering me, and I can't lay my finger on it. You probably figured that was the best way out. To kick over the chair and end it all. Patsy, remind me to give you a raise. And what did I do? I've got it. Look, Patsy. Cornish was a short man. Well, so what? Patsy Cornish couldn't have hanged himself. Well, why not? Don't you remember, Patsy? The only furniture in that room was a bed. And Cornish was so short he never could reach that noose from the bed where it was. Of course, Nick. The bed was on the other side of the room. Patsy Cornish was murdered. She eliminates him as a suspect. Probably he was killed by the same man who killed Hamill. But who, Nick? Who? I wish I knew. I wish I Hi, knew. Nick. Hiya, Patsy. Well, that isn't the missing link. Scubby, did you find out anything about that car that nearly ran me down this afternoon? Oh, you bet, Nick. Good. But what a trial I've been having. Wait till you hear what I have to tell you. Well, I had to get the license commissioner out of bed to get it, but, oh, boy, it was worth it. Hey, do you know who that car belongs to? Tom Burdick, Hamill's partner. Good boy, Scubby. Did you get his address, too? Yeah, some deserted neck of the woods out in Long Island. I've got the address here somewhere. Fine. Come on, Scubby. You and I are going to pay him a visit. You know, Scubby... The more I think of it, the more it looks as if Tom Burdick might be mixed up in this somewhere. Oh, I hope so, Nick. Otherwise, we're using up a lot of gas in this jalopy of mine for nothing. Hey, have you noticed anything funny, Nick? You mean that car that's been trailing us for the last few minutes? That's it. What do you make of it, Nick? I don't know, Scubby. But I think we'll be finding out quickly enough. They're overtaking us. Better step on it. Okay, Nick. Here we go. How are we doing? Not so good, Scubby. They're still gaining on us. Can you give her any more gas? I'll try. There. They still coming up? Yes, yeah, Scubby. And fast. Hey. Hey, Scubby, they're shooting at us. You're telling me. Watch it. Here they come. Well, I've done all I can, Nick. This old bus won't go any faster. Well, let's try no sticks, Scubby. When they get close to us, slam on your brakes and pull over to the side of the road. Yeah? They won't be expecting that. It may throw them completely off balance and spoil their aim. Okay, Nick. You say when. 
Now, pull over. Oh, oh boy. That was a close one. Are you all right, Nick? Yeah. Well, we won't see them anymore for a while. Get going, Scubby. We've got to make up for lost time. Well, Nick, I've got to hand it to you. You have the darndest way of getting into a cellar. Well, we had to get into Verdict's house somehow. This cellar with its creek entrance from the garage looked like the safest way. Especially with those two vicious-looking dogs posted at both the front and back doors of the house. Well, they sure were big ones, too. I hate to meet one of them. Hey, where do you think this is going to lead us to, Nick? We should find a stairway going upstairs, unless I'm very much mistaken. Yeah? Yeah. Here's one. All right, let's go up. Quite careful. All right, Nick, you lead the way. I'm with you. Here's the door. Well, I hope it's open. No, darn it, it's locked. I'll soon fix that. There. All right, Scubby, come on. No, wait, wait, wait. Someone's coming into the room, Scubby. Get back. We can hear through the crack of the door. I'll leave it open in a loop. Well, Mrs. Burdick, I'm certainly glad you called me up. I'm only too happy to be here at a time like this. After all, we're practically neighbors, aren't we? Oh, I just had to talk to someone, Mr. Garrick. I'm so worried about Tom and those horrible things that have been happening at the office. What do you make of all this? Well, I wouldn't worry about it too much, Mrs. Burdick. I'm sure Tom can take care of himself, if he has to. What do you mean, Mr. Garrick? Oh, nothing, nothing. But he has been acting rather strangely lately. Well, that's just it. I'm so worried. I haven't seen or heard from him all day. He's never been so late coming home from the office. Why, well, it's after 11. Oh, there's really nothing to worry about, Mrs. Burdick, even in a case like this. Of course, it looks very peculiar for Tom to be missing his way, especially at this particular time. Mr. But Garrick, I'm... you don't think Tom had anything to do with all this sort of... Well, Mrs. Burdick, I like Tom very much. I would hate to think that Tom had anything to do with this murder. Of course, things are... Well, Scubby, we don't seem to be learning much this way. Might as well go in and let him know we're here. Yeah, sure, Nick. Good evening, Mr. Garrick. Why, uh, Mr. Carter, what are you doing here? I just came along with one of my assistants, Scubby Wilson, to talk to Mr. Burdick. We came in this way because we didn't want to disturb the dogs. Oh, really? Uh, who are you? Oh, Mrs. Burdick, uh, this is Mr. Nick Carter. He's in charge of investigating Hamill's death. Mr. Carter, the detective? Nothing's happened to Tom, has it? I don't believe so, Mrs. Burdick. I just want to ask him a few questions when he arrives. Well, maybe that's why Tom hasn't come home. Maybe he's afraid of... Uh, maybe that's he now. Wait, wait, I'll go look out the window to see if that's his car. Carter, I must warn you to be careful. Burdick's a dangerous man. Tom! Tom! Nick Carter's here! Please, Mrs. Burdick, come away from that window. Here to see you. you won't do me any good that way, Mrs. Tom. Burdick. Tom! Stop it, you hear me, please! That's his car, Mr. Carter. Look, he's getting away! Come on, Scully, let's get after him. Okay, I'll go with you, Carter. Hurry up. I want to know why he runs away when he hears my name. I hope this car of yours stays on the road, Carter. Don't worry about it, Mr. Garrick. Carter, I, I didn't want to say so much in front of Mrs. Burdick, but we've all been afraid of Burdick. All right, all right. Scubby, let's keep your foot on that throttle and keep after him. Oh, boy, we sure made that one on two wheels. Nick, I'm pushing this crate as fast as you'll go, but we don't seem to be getting any closer. That car of Burdick's is your step. As long as we hang on and don't lose him, I'll be satisfied. Hey, watch it, we're coming to a railroad crossing. So I see. Well, maybe we can head him off now. If Burdick tries to beat that limit to the crossing, he's crazy. Signaling you. Oh, yes. She wants me to go into Burdick. You wait for me here, Scully. Okay, Nick. Burdick? Burdick, can you hear me? Yes, Carter. I can hear you. Carter, I'm a dying man. Yes, I, I know. I swear to you, I 
didn't kill Hamill or Cornish. Then why did you try to run me down with your car this afternoon? Carter, I didn't do that. All I know is that for several hours this afternoon, my car was mysteriously missing. I didn't find it again until I started home this evening. Pretty. Why did you run away from your home tonight when your wife told you we were there? How about the securities we found on you after the wreck? It wasn't you. It was securities. I took them so that... Yes, Burdick? Why did you take them? I took them so I could keep him from stealing them. Who? Burdick, who? Burdick, who's he? as quick as I could. Have you found anything yet? I think so. Scotty Burdick wasn't lying to me. I found this in the bottom drawer of the desk in the front office here. A book? Well, is that what Burdick meant? Just look at that title. Studies of Various Angles of Bullets in Flight. Well, so what, Nick? Scotty, that's the way Hamill was killed. It all adds up perfectly. Now I know why I heard only one shot when I found three empty shells and a murder weapon. Three shots were fired, but two of them were fired at a different time from the third. Well, do you know where the other two bullets are, Nick? I do. Follow me out in the hall and I'll show you. Yeah? You see, Scotty, as soon as I found that book in the flight of bullets, I did a bit of looking around, and I finally found them. Well, where are they? In the office here? No, Scotty, in the corridor. Right over there in that dark corner, embedded in the wall beside the elevator shaft, about a half a dozen feet from where Hamill was killed. Well, what are they doing over there? Scotty, this was a very ingenious crime. And if you watch carefully, I'll show you just how ingenious it really was. Now, you notice that Cornish's office is the only one facing the corridor leading from the elevator. Yeah. So what? Well, in order to shoot someone coming down the hall, the murderer, if he were in any office but Cornish's, would have to step from his office out into this corridor and be seen. Right? Yeah, right. But our murderer was very clever. I got the answer when I located the book and when I found these embedded in the wall beside the elevator shaft. The two missing bullets. Right. Well, hey, they're all banged up. Precisely, just like the murder bullet. And that's what gave me the answer. You see, Scubby, yeah. the murderer never left his office. He stood inside the front office, the one around the corner, on the lower leg of the L-shaped corridor, and aimed at that steel pillar built into the wall over there. When the bullet hit the steel face of the pillar, it was deflected into Hamill's lungs. Look here. You see these marks on the face of the pillar here? Where? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, those are the bullet marks. Oh, well, gosh, Nick, that's fantastic. Hey, are you sure you're right? Positive. Don't you see, Scubby? That explains the other two shots that were fired. They weren't fired at Hamill, and they weren't fired at the time the murder was committed. They were practice shots used by the murderer to be sure he had the correct angle from which to shoot Hamill. Gosh, Nick, I've certainly got to hand it to you. Yes, but we still have to get the murderer. But how? And who is it, Nick? I rather think that if we step back in the office and wait, we'll find out soon enough, Scubby. Well, what do you mean, Nick? I mean that whoever it is will be in this office within the next few minutes, because after my discoveries, I made a couple of phone calls. And I invited the two remaining partners to meet me here. Shh. Here comes someone now. No. no. Oh, how do you do, gentlemen? Oh, hello, Garrick. I got your phone call, Carter, and I got here as fast as I could. Garrick, have you seen this book before? Mm, studies of various angles of bullets in flight. Why, yes. Now that I think of it, I think I have. Does it belong to you? No, it doesn't. But I remember that one day when I was with Mr. Nelson, he stopped in front of a bookshop and looked at it. Rather closely now that I think of it. Yes, I, I'm sure it was Nelson. Very interesting. Now, tell me, Mr. Garrick, when the murder was committed, are you positive that you and Mr. Nelson were in this office together? That's right, Mr. Carter. And you show me exactly where each of you stood at the time the shot was fired. Well, now, let me see. I was uh, here, facing the window, 
And Nelson was, well, standing uh, right about here by the door. Mm-hmm. I see. Did you notice in which direction he was facing at the time? Yes, I remember. This way, facing the corridor. In other words, the way he was standing, you could see him only in profile. That's right. Well, there's no question that that's how it was done, Scubby. The murderer planted himself in this office so that he could establish a strong alibi. He then took the gun from his pocket, unseen by the other person in the room, who could see him only in profile, and then fired it at that steel pillar. Then as he ran into the corridor with a rest, after Hamill was dead, he dropped the gun into the umbrella stand in front of Cornish's office. Well, Carter, do you mean that Nelson is the one How who... do you do, gentlemen? Uh, did I hear my name mentioned? Yes, Nelson, you did. Why did you kill Hamill and Cornish? Please, Garrick, don't be ridiculous. Oh, Nelson, does this book look familiar to you? Uh, this book? Uh, no, I can't say that it does. You sure you've never seen this book before? Hmm. Now that you mention it, I may have glanced at it in a bookshop at one time or another, but then I look over a lot of books. I like to browse. I see. Nelson, see how you approve of this story of Hamill's murder. Yes? The killer knew of Cornish's criminal record, and he figured he could embezzle some of the firm's money and pin it on an innocent man. Then when he found out that Hamill was becoming suspicious and was having the accounts checked... He became panicky and afraid that it might not work out the way he had planned. So he decided to kill Hamill. Then when he happened to overhear Hamill's conversation with me over the telephone, he hurriedly borrowed Burdick's car without Burdick's knowledge and tried to get rid of me. That's an interesting way out, Mr. Carter. Have you also a theory as to who the killer is? I have. By the process of elimination, it has to be either you or Mr. Garrick or an unknown. And I've already proved that I didn't do it. It must have been an unknown then, Mr. Carter. I certainly didn't kill Hamill. I had nothing to do with the murder. When the shot was fired, I was right here in this room with Mr. Garrick. He can testify to that. He has already, Mr. Nelson. In fact, Mr. Carter, I was standing right here facing the window when the shot was fired. Oh, no. That's where I was, Mr. Carter. Standing there at the window. Now, please, Garrick. Please, gentlemen, please. You don't have to argue about it. I know who was at the window, and I know who fired the fatal shot. Scubby, take a look at the flyleaf of this book. Well, what are they, Nick? They look like the scribbles that some guys draw when they have nothing else to do. Oh, doodles, they call them. Exactly. While I was looking through the various offices, I found some papers with these same doodling marks on them in one of the desks. And these marks were made by the murderer. Garrick, I arrest you. Oh, Sergeant, he's got a gun! Oh, there. Well, Scubby... Pick up the pieces. Oh, boy. There's the murderer, Garrick. He's also the man who tried to murder you and me last night in the road of Burdick's home. Well, I'll be. You see, Scubby, Burdick has his suspicions about Garrick. That's why we found those securities on him. He took them so that they wouldn't fall into Garrick's hands. He suddenly found out that Garrick was an unscrupulous crook. And that was the reason he ran when Mrs. Burdick called him. He saw Garrick at the window and was afraid of him. Well, Nick, I must say he had me fooled when he said that Nelson was standing at the door of the office here when he was really there himself. Yes, in telling us who was in this office, that clever murderer just reversed the positions in which he and Mr. Nelson were standing when the murder was committed. But once I saw the marks on that flyleaf, I knew who stood where. And that's why I had Nelson come up here, to force Garrick's hand. Well, Nick, one way's as good as another as long as you get results. And you always seem to do that. to come back, did you? Yes, Betsy, it's all over. Well, I think you can go home now. Why, Mr. Carter, are you sure you can spare me? Why not? You've been so busy on this case all night, Mr. Carter, you may not have noticed that it is now a new day. And a good secretary is always on the job the first thing in the morning. Shall I take a letter, Mr. Carter? <laughs> was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called An Angle on Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mutilated Bullet. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you by W.O.R. Mutual. And now, Nick, what's next week's story all about? Well, when this case was first brought to me, it seemed so routine and uninteresting that I practically turned it down. But it was far from routine once you got into it, wasn't it, Nick? Yes, indeed. So far from it that 
I almost got myself bumped off investigating it. It's really the story of a man who thought he was so much cleverer than Nick that he could outwit him every time. I don't suppose he got away with it. No. He found he wasn't really so clever after all. Like practically every criminal I ever met, he gave himself away by being too clever. So sounds like an interesting tale, Nick. Not only interesting, but downright exciting. But more of that next week. So long, folks. So long. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you've just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, and Scubby by John Kane. The story was written for Nick Carter by George Gordon. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled The Body on the Slab or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Beginning Wednesday, November 3rd, The Return of Nick Carter, which is produced in the studios of WOR, will be broadcast over most of these stations on Wednesday evenings at 8.30 Eastern Wartime. Remember the new time... Wednesdays at 8.30 Eastern Wartime, beginning Wednesday, November 3rd. This is Mutual. This, I believe. Robert Boothby has been a member of the British Parliament for 28 years. His forthrightness and originality brought him to the attention of Winston Churchill. From 1926 to 1929, he was Churchill's parliamentary private secretary. He gained distinction when he severely criticized his government for failing to react to the Hitler menace. He is now vice president of the Economic Committee in the Council of Europe. Here now is Robert Boothby. Man is born not to solve the problems of the universe, but to find out where the problem applies and then to restrain himself within the limits of the comprehensible. His faculties are not sufficient to measure the actions of the universe, and an attempt to explain the outer world by reason is, with his narrow view, vain. Thus Goethe, talking his usual good sense. I find myself inhabiting a world which seems to me to have been singularly ill-contrived. But I don't presume to know the reason why, still less the purpose of it all, if there be one. It is enough for me that I love life, that with my limited human vision I can conceive of no other purpose than the enjoyment of it, and that for most people the terms of life are not at present good enough. I entered politics as a very young man with the sole purpose of doing what I could to improve these terms. As an ardent disciple of Keynes, I concentrated on the economics of expansion, and fought as best I could against the deflation that crippled the heavy industries of Europe in the 20s, drove millions of workers off the land and out of work, doubled the burden of all debts, and culminated in the worst economic crisis known to history. I soon discovered that there were even graver threats to our 20th century civilization. First, the advent of two purely materialist philosophies, communism and its antithesis, fascism, which denied the significance and the importance of the individual and led directly to what Bertrand Russell has described as the intoxication of power. Second, the existence in human nature of an aggressive and destructive instinct, which, if it prevailed against the opposing life instinct, could easily and quickly bring about the total destruction of the human race. To planned economic expansion, I therefore added the achievement of individual freedom and of collective security derived from an organic union of the free world as the keynotes of my political credo and philosophy. I sought and still seek for a satisfactory solution between the instinctive demands of the individual and the social claims of a civilized society. I'm a buttress rather than a pillar of the church, but I believe with the protagonists of orthodox religion that the basic struggle of humanity is waged within each one of us. What the psychologists call the life instinct, 
The churches call God. And what the psychologists call the death instinct, the churches call the devil. But religion and psychology are now fighting on the same side for the survival of mankind. Finally, I believe in the ultimate value of the individual human personality. To me, as to the late Professor McNeil Dixon, the most astonishing thing about the human being is not his intellect and bodily structure, profoundly mysterious as these are, but the range of his vision, his gaze into the infinite distance, his lonely passion for ideas and ideals for which he will endure suffering, privation and death, in the profound conviction that if nothing is worth dying for, nothing is worth living for. In this affair, it seems to me the choice which confronts us is not obscure. You seek to free or to imprison the human spirit, and therefore you are on the side of justice, liberty, decency, toleration, and humanity, or against them. That was Robert Boothby, an Englishman and member of Parliament, who has been described as the Friar Tuck of British politics because of his unintellectual appearance and manner. NBC presents transcribed Frank Lovejoy in Night Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Mostly I write about people, a great commodity, all kinds of people. Tall, short, honest, crooked, hopeful, and hopeless. You stand on the corner of State and Lake at noon and they rush by you like an unchecked avalanche. You buy a ticket at Soldier's Field and you see them again. A faceless, nameless mass of humanity, shouting, shoving, pushing. They all look alike when you see them that way, in the aggregate. But take them one at a time. Watch them when they're worried or scared. Listen to them when they brag or weep. Listen well, don't jump to conclusions, and maybe you get yourself a story. That's my job. It was a brutal, hot night. It was too hot to hang around the city room, but the street wasn't any better. The air stood still, and so did my mind. I was as devoid of inspiration on what to tell my alleged readers as I was on ideas on how to keep cool. The seer sucker suit I'd bought in the hopes it would give me a Princeton air only made me look like a wilted bookkeeper. I stood on the corner in front of the paper to take off my coat when a voice called from a parked car. Hey, Stump, get in the car. Take you for a little ride. Hmm? I turned around and the voice came from the back seat of a conservative job. A robin's egg blue limousine, and it belonged to Mushy Sindel. A dapper little hood who muscled into crime between repeal and keepover. I wouldn't say he's the most powerful racketeer in Chicago, but when he calls for you personally, well, it's not considered polite to refuse. So I got in, and the car nosed its bulk into traffic. How do you like my new car, Randy? Real George. Hey, it's cool in here. Naturally. You think I'm going to swear my brains out? <laughs> How'd you get it so cool, Mushy? Refrigeration. With a humidity like it is outside, you got to use refrigeration. Got to be careful with refrigeration. You know, too much, you catch cold. You see this gadget over here? What do you think? Thermostat. I even control the temperature. Hey, that's terrific. You're darn right. Nothing but the best. If you got the door, you can buy anything. If it's hot, you cool it off. If it's cold, you heat it up. If you like something, you buy it. If you don't, you pay to get rid of it. <laughs> Simple as that. Money talks. With you, it yells murder. <laughs> You're a kidder, Randy. A real kidder. You come a long way, Mushy. In the old days, bulletproof cars. Now, heat proof. <laughs> With me, same difference. I'm a pretty good kidder myself, huh? Well, that depends. Where are you taking me? I gather you didn't pick me up just to cool me off. I hope. Ah, you're smart, Randy. Get right to the point. That's what I like about you. Hey, yeah, you're cute, too. Where are we going? I'm going to give you the break of your life, kid. I'm going to let you scoop every paper in town. Oh? You're going to let the government look into your safety deposit box? <laughs> You're a ride, a real ride. Yeah. <laughs> and I've enjoyed the ride, and I'm all cooled off now, and I've got a living to make, so if you all have handsome up there in the front seat, stop this armored icebox, I'll dig up a story. Relax, Stone, relax. It's all taken care of. 
I got your story. Now, we'll get out here. Here? This is the old Empress Theater. So what? Now, don't tell me that you're making book in the lobby. Now, you know it ain't legal to make book anymore. Yeah, I know. I just wondered if you knew. Look, Randy, I laughed at your bum jokes, but this crack ain't funny. And ain't, ain't even friendly, see? I see. Okay, then. We go inside. The Empress Theater had been dark for months, and judging from the deserted lobby, as I followed Mushy, it was still dark. But as we got inside, I discovered there was a rehearsal going on. The pit was full of musicians. The electricians were experimenting with lighting effects. And on the stage, no less than 50 dancers were doing a chorus number. Mushy sat down in the aisle about midway in the house, and since it was cool there, so did I. Watch those kids dance, eh? I bought me the best dancers in Chicago. You see those guys in the pit? Real long hand musicians playing the winter for those uh, symphony things, you know? <laughs> like I told you, money can buy anything. Mushy, are you bankrolling this show? So what's wrong with that? Baby's got dollar. You wanted the doll on the vine because she ain't got a showcase for it? Baby? The doll. Shh, shh. Wait a minute. Here's on this. Wait till you see her. Wait till you see the clashes. This is going to hold me on. In one way, Mushy was right in his appraisal of Baby's talent. When she was on the stage, you weren't likely to close your eyes. She was a big girl, very blonde, and poured into a more off than on practice costume. She couldn't dance, that's for sure, but I'll give her this. She was willing to please. Baby didn't need a showcase for her talent. Baby needed a runway. <laughs> that's great, baby. That's wonderful. Wonderful, sweetie. Wonderful. <laughs> Well, Randy, now you've seen her. What do you think? Huh? Oh, that's uh, quite a girl. <laughs> didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you? Where's the story you brought me in to get? Baby. Baby's a story. You're going to plug in your newspaper, see? Everybody in Chicago is going to know about her. When we open next month, she's going to be a smash, and then we go on to New York. Wait a minute, Mushy. Know? Mushy, hold it. I don't do that kind of thing. You want George Davis. He handles the drama page. Him, I don't know. You, I do. What do you want? What do you want, huh? How much? Name your price. Well, I'm flattered, Mushy, but... It can't be bought, huh? Yeah, now, don't give me that. Everybody's got a price. Well, come on, come on. Name your price. Well, you shut up up there. I'm trying to talk. Hey, Joe. Go on with a rehearsal, huh? I can't, Mr. Sindel. What do you mean you can't? You're the stage manager, ain't you? What do you think I'll pay you for? I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Sindel, but we've done everything we can without Mr. Jerome. Jerome. You mean he didn't show up for rehearsal? Oh, he showed up. They poured him out of a taxi. Sleeping now in the dressing room. So I wake him up. Do I have to think of everything? Got a bum on the stage. Well, I, I'm afraid we can't. He he won't see light of day till tomorrow. Oh, no. Why it'll mushy Sintel get through with him? Mushy charged up toward the dressing rooms, followed by a nervous stage manager, followed by me. I was curious to see him buy his way out of this situation. But he didn't get beyond the stairs to the stage. He was stopped there by one of the chorus boys. Please, Mr. Sindel, I know the dance. Out of my way, get out But of I'm Mr. Jerome's understudy. I know all the routines, all the numbers. If you'd only let me do it just this once, just for tonight. Well, understudy, huh? You can do all the numbers, all the routines? <laughs> you bet I can. You can, huh? All right, then what are we waiting for? Hey, Joe! Oh! No, you don't, Mush. Oh, now, baby. I'm not going to dance with no amateur. I'm tired. I want to go home with my feet hurt. Now, baby, don't forget. We're open in a month. We got to be good. We got to mm. practice. If this kid can dance with you, it'll be one more rehearsal. You'll be that much better, you see? You don't want that bum Jerome to steal all the notices, do you? How much? Now, go on, yeah. baby. Dance with a kid, will you? What do you got to lose? Thank you, Mr. Sindel. You don't know what you've done for me. Not to mention what he's doing to me. <laughs> The orchestra hit it, and the lights did. As they came up again, Baby and the understudy were discovered on stage, curled up on a big dated drum. And they went into the number. It was painful to watch. Baby was way out of her class. She was way out of her class, because the boy was great. How great, I didn't realize until he did another number, and another, and finally a solo. It 
was a blues number, low down and melancholy. And it could have been just that, just the dance routine, but he made it more, much more. He made it into a lament for a lost people. And yet, in it, you could feel promise and hope. I'm not one to go wild for terpsichore, but the way this boy danced, he made it something intangibly sensitive, yet he gave it guts and virility. He could have made a stevedore understand what he was trying to say. Yes, and even Mushy Sindel. Mushy was watching the boy with a look on his face I'd only see him wear when one of his nags was out in front. When the last bar was finished... And it was a spontaneous thing. Performers, stagehands, the most hard-boiled audience in the world applauding and cheering. Yes, sir, a real success story. The boy took a bow, and he was grinning from ear to ear, and then he ran into the wing. Oh, what do you think, Ronnie? Huh? What do you think? Oh, he's got it, Mushy. I'm going to make a star out of that kid. Why, he'll be the biggest thing on Broadway in the movies. I'll make him so famous he'll even be driving a car like mine. Hey, Joe! Hey, Joe! Oh, what is that stage manager? You can never find anybody. Joe! Here I am, Mr. Sindel. Uh, hey, Joe, come here, come here. Get that kid. I want to sign him up. Exclusive contract. Oh, I'm afraid you can't. What do you mean you can't? We'll dump Jerome. We'll start a kid in his place. But you can't. Who do you think you're talking to? I can do anything. So Jerome makes a stink. I buy off his contract. I want that kid. I don't care what it costs, what we got to do. I want the kid. Now bring him in here. But that, that's what I've been trying to tell you. He's gone. What? He quit. What are you talking about? He can't quit. But he did. Two weeks ago, he gave in his notice. Tonight was his last night. Well, why didn't you tell me before? Well, I didn't think it was important. He was just a chorus boy. And you let him get away. Why, you stupid, idiotic, crazy, no good numbskull. I decided not to wait for the bloodshed. I walked across the stage and was on my way to the stage door exit when Baby intercepted me. Look, you. Who, me? Yeah. Don't go making like we're lost and found, huh? Don't get any ideas about bringing that kid back here. He's gone. He's happy. I'm happy. Just leave it late. Oh? You didn't like his dancing? You kidding? He was terrific, and you know it. Oh, I see. It's the competition that bothers you. Look, newsboy. With Jerome, this turkey will be stuffed. But with that kid, the show will be a hit, and that means... That means I got to sweat in the spotlight every night and soak my feet when the show's over and watch my weight. Ain't that better where to live? Well, I don't get it. Mushy said that he was putting on the show for you. Uh, that much. You don't have any brains. He thinks I belong in show business. But believe me, I've had my fill of show business and up to here. I've done my time. Five a day. Now all I want to do is relax. And I want to get fat. And I want to wear my mink coat and cook for mushy. Maybe that little jerk will marry me. So, so don't go bringing that kid back here. Okay. <laughs> it's okay with me. But you better check with mushy. <laughs> It was an interesting slant on the theater. A gangster bank calling a show for a girl who didn't want a career. But if I knew Mushy, she'd have her career no matter what it cost. And it was even money he'd have the understudy signature in a contract before the night was out. It was a newsworthy little item, but strictly for the drama page, and I still had a story to find. So I waved goodbye to Mushy. I walked out the stage door into the alley where the stage manager was cooling off after his bout with Mushy. Who's he yelling at now? Ah, uh, the uh, orchestra leader. You know, this is the last time, believe me, that I'll ever manage a show for anybody like him. That ignorant, illiterate, oh, old Oh, he's all right. He's all right. He'll calm down when the kid comes back. How did I know a thing like this would happen? Why, I'd never have accepted his notice. Love to see that kid's face when he finds out they want him to replace the star. Oh, he knows. He knows? Yeah, that's what burns me. The doorman tells me that he stood right there in the wings and heard the whole thing. He heard Sindel say that he'd make him a star. And then he just walks off and leaves me holding the bag. Who is this boy? Oh, just a hoofer, a nobody. Name's Larry Wilson. Why, he hadn't worked in months until I gave him a job. But didn't he say why he was quitting? Didn't he uh, say anything? Well, not to me, he didn't. Saved his exit line for the doorman. Well, what did he say to the doorman? Well, I'll give it to you verbatim. Not that it makes any sense. He said, and I quote, Just think, Pop, I could have been a star. Could have been? Verbatim. Could have been. NBC is bringing you Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. This coming Monday, 
thousands of children will be going back to school. Four times a day, these children will be walking to and from school. You are urged to be careful, to be watchful, to be safe. Statistics show that in one year's time, 61,000 children were killed or injured by motor vehicles. Watch for children darting out from that blind spot between parked cars. Watch for them as they get on and off school buses. Watch for children playing on the sidewalk and crossing the streets going to and from school. Remember this slogan, A child may dare. Drive with care. And now back to Night Beat and Randy Stone. What started off to be the cliché of the understudy had twisted its way into my line of fire. My curiosity was aroused, to say the least. What was Larry Wilson like, and why had he quit? It was easy to find out where he lived. The doorman had his address, along with the names and addresses of all the kids in the chorus. It was a theatrical boarding house on Gordon Street. A tired, mildewed-looking place with a landlady to match. Her name was Mrs. Dick. If you've come about a room, I got one, but it ain't ready yet. I'm not looking for a room. I'm looking for one of your rumors. Oh, oh, you some money, huh? Well, take it from me. It won't do you much good to dun them, any of them. They're show people. Well, I just want to talk to one of them, a boy by the name of Larry Wilson. Oh, that one. A real creep. Take it from me. Oh? In what way? Keeps his room clean. I go in there, there's never anything lying around. Clean like a tomb. Dancing. What sort of a job is that for a man, dancing? Well, this is all a very interesting character analysis, but I'd like to talk to Mr. Wilson if you'll call him. You're too late. He's gone. He's gone? When he come back here tonight after the rehearsal, all flushed and excited, he danced up the stairs, mind you, whistling. As if the world wasn't gone to pieces and people didn't have trouble all over. I told the people in this house I'd like a quiet, respectable place. I think there were a cage full of monkeys, the way these show people carry on. Yeah, uh, about Mr. Wilson. Well, what about him? He's gone. Well, where'd he go? Well, how would I know? I'm the last one who knows what's going on in my own house. I've been like a mother to these kids. I took care of them, fed them when they had the money to pay. And when they get a break, they just walk out on me. I said to him, I don't suppose we'll be hearing from you now that you've got your break. And he said, I won't forget you, Mrs. Diggs. Bless you, Mrs. Diggs. That way he's got. Uh, what way? Oh, humble, I guess you'd call it. Oh, he's got that humble act down pat. <laughs> if I may make an observation, you don't seem to like Larry Wilson. What good does it do to like any of them? You wait on them hand and foot. When they get a break, they move out on you. You keep talking about Larry getting a break. You mean the show he's been rehearsing with? Oh, not that, no. Well, that ain't good enough for him, apparently. He's leaving town. Probably going to Hollywood. Oh, he told me about him off in the lead tonight. Well, take it from me, you can't believe these show people when they shoot off their mouths. You take it from me, it's on the level. They offered him the lead and he turned it down. See? What'd I tell you? He's got something better up his sleeve. He's going someplace grand to live where it'll cost him a lot more than here. And after I treated him like a mother. But do you have any possible idea where I could find him? Well, you might ask her. Her? Dan Dugan. She was always lollygagging around after him. Now, where does Jan Dugan live? Well, she lives here, like all the rest of the unemployed actors in town. Oh, well, would you call her, please? I can't. She's not home. She'll get home till after 11. <laughs> well, do you know where I could find her? Sure, she's on the corner. It's a ham and egg. She slings hash there. Something no decent girl would have done in my day. Take it from me. Yeah, I uh, take it you've been a mother to Miss Dugan, too. Just how do you mean that? Well, if I tried to be explicit, I'm afraid you'd be insulted. Yeah. The mother of Chicago's unemployed thespian slammed the door in my face. The mother vulture, that is. I walked out of the corner where the white enameled ham and egg gleamed in the shabby neighborhood like an elk's tooth on a dark vest. It was five minutes of eleven. There weren't many customers in the place. A dark-haired waitress was pinning on the cap and apron that was starched to stiff as celluloid, while a fragile blonde, about to go off duty, gave her a rundown on who had been served and who hadn't. I sat on a stool. The brunette waitress started to serve me. I uh, know the blonde young lady, please. Me? Well, but I'm going off duty, sir. Is your name Jan Dugan? Yes. I'd like to talk to you, if I could, about Larry Wilson. Larry? What about Larry? Well, my name is Randy Stone. I'm with the Chicago Star. He's hurt. 
Something's happened to him. Has he had an accident? Is that it? Oh, no, no, no. It's nothing like that. I oh. I just want to ask you some general questions about him. I'm a friend of Larry's. Oh, well, all right. If you'll wait for me out on the sidewalk, I'll be right out, Mr. Stone. <laughs> I sat on the fire hydrant in front and waited for her. It's funny, I'd only exchanged a few words with her, but instinctively I felt this girl who was swinging hash because the theater hadn't found a place for her would one day be a great actress. Not because she was theatrical, she wasn't. She was plain, simple, and unaffected. She looked you right in the eye when she talked to you, and you could see it shining there back of her eyes. Sincerity and depth. Sorry I kept you waiting, Mr. Stone, but I'm not allowed to leave until the stroke of 11. Mrs. Diggs says you're an actress. Well, I think I'm an actress, but I haven't proven it to anyone else. I thought we could talk for a minute. Shall we walk back to your boarding house? Oh, no. Bad enough to have to sleep there without being there when you don't have to. Yes, I know. I've met Mother Diggs. Oh, what about Larry? You said you were a friend of his? Well, it's not exactly accurate. Let's say I'm a fan. I've never met him, but I saw him dance tonight. You saw him dance? Yeah. Didn't you know he went on tonight for Jerome? That they'd offered him the lead in the show? Did they? Oh, did they really? He'd have been on his way to being a star, but he turned it down. Mrs. Diggs said he must have had another offer. Yes. Yes, another offer. Oh, I wish I could have seen him. You you say he was, was good, huh? He was magnificent. Oh, I knew he would be. I, I've never seen him dance, but he talked to me about it. and Well, I've talked to him about being an actress. Sometimes you just have to talk about it. It's like you're starving, and if you don't talk about it, you'll die. Did Larry feel that way about dancing, Irene? Oh, no. No, but then, of course, Larry was different than other people. He loved to dance, but he didn't need it, like I need to act. Larry was... Well, I, I guess you could say Larry knew where he was going, so he was never afraid of failure or success or, well, anything. Why past tense, Jan? It's like you were saying Larry's gone for good. I'm trying to get used to it. Must be a pretty hot deal he's got. Seems he walked out on everything, even you. He never was in love with me, Mr. Stone. Don't get that idea. And he couldn't help it that I was in love with him. Oh, he talked to me lots of times about it. He he tried to get me to go out with other men, but it just wasn't any good. Well, I didn't mean to probe, Jan. I, I'd like to talk to Larry. Do you know where he went? Yes, I, I can take you there and... When you see him, will you give him a message for me? Why don't you give it to him yourself? Oh, no, I'd, I'd be afraid I'd cry, and I, I wouldn't want to do that. All right, Jan. What's the message? Well, tell him... Tell him this afternoon when we said goodbye that... Well, I said a lot of things I didn't mean. Tell him I'm sorry. Tell him I've thought about it, and, and I'm trying to get used to it. Tell him I won't ever forget him. We walked down the street two or three blocks. She didn't look at me again. My mind was churning with the bits and pieces of the jigsaw that was Larry Wilson. I felt the frustration of a jigsaw addict who's searching for that last piece to complete the puzzle. Yet I couldn't ask Jan Dugan any more questions. I didn't have the heart to. Here we are, Mr. Stone. Here? You'll find him in there. She ran into the darkness, and I stood and looked at the gray stone building with its stained glass windows and cross. St. Michael's Church. But it wasn't in front of the church we'd stopped, but at the rectory. I went up the sidewalk and knocked at the door. An elderly priest opened it. Yes? Oh, excuse me, Father. I'm looking for a young man by the name of Larry Wilson. I was told I could find him here. Come in. In here, in my study. It's comfortable here. Thank you. Larry Wilson. Sit down, young man. Sit down. Thank you, Father. And uh, what did you want to see Larry about? Oh, is he here? Yes. He's in the church. No, 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 no. no don't go in. No. Uh, tell me, young man, what do you want to see him about? I want to give him a message. A message now? Yes, my girl named Jan Dugan. Jan Dugan. And uh, what is the message, if you don't mind telling me? Well, I... I uh... I don't exactly understand it, but I gather that whatever he's going to do is okay with her. Uh, a good girl, Jan. 
Um, and is all, that all you came for, young man? Uh, no, not exactly. See, Father, my name is Randy Stone. I'm a newspaper man. Uh, I'm afraid I came out of curiosity. It's a good thing, curiosity, within reason. And what is it you're curious about? Well, I caught a rehearsal tonight, uh, of a show. I, I saw Larry Wilson dance. Did you now? And how was the last? Well, he was brilliant. That's the only word for it. He could have had the lead in the show. He could have become a star. Star? You mean famous like the Kelly boy out in Hollywood? Yeah, yeah. Or uh, a stare, or a bulger. He's as good as any of them. Ah, it's a great profession. Dancing. Brings joy to the heart of the dancer, and it spills joy out over to everybody that watches. And you say Larry was good, and that he had what it takes. Oh, that and more. But he ran out. That's what I'm curious about. Why does a dancer, one who can dance like he does, quit when success is right there? No, no, hold it, hold it. Don't go jumping to conclusions, Larry. Larry didn't run out. He made a decision tonight, and I might add a very difficult one. I don't follow you, Father. When a man has a talent, it's a gift from God. He should cherish it and develop it and, and give it to the world. It's a lucky man to have a talent, but Larry... Well, Larry had a problem. You see, he had two talents, and he couldn't follow them both. He had to give one up. The choice had to be from inside. It had to be right. And tonight, he made that choice. What, Father? What other talent? Oh, didn't you know, lad? Why, Larry's gone to school. He's leaving tonight for the seminary. Seminary? Yes. Larry's going to become a priest. For the second time, I had no words. I picked up my hat and said thank you and good night. I walked out of the rectory down the sidewalk, and there, waiting for me at the curb, was the blue armored icebox and the man who could buy anything, Mushy Sindel. Well, Stone, you took your time coming out. How'd you know I was here? I had my boys tell you when you started asking questions about this Larry Wilson. I know you'd track him down. Did you find him? Yeah, he's in there. Ah, hiding in a church, huh? What a bum do? Cross me and stand up with some other show? Uh, yeah, something like that. I wouldn't go in if I were you, Marcy. I'm afraid he's not available. <laughs> what do you mean? Everybody's available. For a price. Well, I don't know. I'll lay your odds you can't buy off his sponsor. He's signed for a long run. No. Just watch me operate. He says in there, huh? Yeah. Okay. You coming? No, no, I've uh, I got a story to write, but call me later at the paper, will you, Mushy? Huh? I'd like to get your reaction. <laughs> People, the city's big commodity. Trying to figure one of them is like trying to figure the races. You call it one way and they run the other. Mushy Sindel, he was easy to figure. He followed a pattern right down the line. But Baby, now there was a twist. Who'd pick her for a frustrated house frog? And Larry Wilson? I'll never see anybody dance again without thinking about him. The boy who made the choice between the glamour and the glory. Copy, boy. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy, is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Tonight's transcribed story was written by John and Gwen Bagney, with music by Robert Armbruster. Featured in tonight's cast were Bill Conrad, Gigi Pearson, Shep Minkin, Ruth Parrott, and Victor Rodman. Frank Lovejoy appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers, producers of The Miracle of Our Lady of Fatima. Listen next week at this time, and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness.
to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. This, I believe. As head of the research group of the Huntington Library in San Marino, California, Robert Glass Cleland is one of this country's leading historians. For over 30 years, he served Occidental College in Los Angeles as a teacher and administrator. During this time, he added much to our knowledge of American history in a number of important and authoritative books. Now, Robert Cleland shares with us a bit of personal history. Some years ago, I had the opportunity of making a 200-mile trip by rowboat from Mexican Hat on the San Juan River in southern Utah to Lee's Ferry on the Colorado. At the time, I was living in the aftermath of a great sorrow. In the nation and the world at large, there was mounting uncertainty, tension, and confusion. The heart had gone out of men and women everywhere. Like all too many of us, I was discouraged and beaten down. I had lost my sense of security and peace of mind. Faith and confidence and hope were broken reeds on which I dared not lean. The way of life I had known and loved, the foundations of my familiar world seemed ready to dissolve. For seven days my companions and I, leaving behind the troubled world of wars and threatened chaos, floated in three small rowboats down the muddy, isolated, and sometimes dangerous waters of the San Juan and Colorado. During all that time, we had no contact with the outside world. It was our usual custom to make camp for the night an hour or two before dark at some convenient spot on the riverbank. But the last evening before reaching our destination, we continued our voyage until nearly midnight. The river was there cooped up and cabined in by its narrow gorge. The massive walls of the canyon rose sheer above the water, almost 4,000 feet. Presently the boats became separated. In one of them, a single companion, the boatman, and I, floated on alone. I have never known such beauty, for the moon was full, and by some witchery or enchantment, its mellow light turned all the river into a street of burnished gold and transformed the massive headlands and giant pinnacles into such shining walls and battlements and towers as John the Beloved beheld in his vision on Patmos of the glory and wonder of the city of God. Someone has said that religion is an experience and not a creed. Now I have a creed that commands my intellectual respect. In essence, it is very simple. I believe in God the Father Almighty, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. I have also the experience of a voyage one moonlight night through the deep canyon of the lonely Colorado River, an experience that made life's anxieties and frustrations and disappointments seem trivial and mean, that gave me a new understanding of the difference between the things that pass away and the things that endure, that brought me an abiding serenity and peace which the world of selfish seeking and desire cannot give and cannot take away, that added new vitality and meaning to my faith in God that enabled me to know as I had never known before the living reality of one in whose sight a thousand years are the years of all eternity itself are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. 
They're the beliefs of Robert Glass Cleland, a distinguished California historian and educator. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Again, that question has been asked of doctors in all parts of the country, doctors in every branch of medicine, and again, the brand name most is Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. It was a cold afternoon in New York. There were six inches of snow in the streets and twice that much on the fire escape outside my window. I looked down at Broadway and watched the miserable pedestrians edging their way over the slippery, ice-covered sidewalks and thought about burning some of my furniture. It was just the day for anything unpleasant, and when the door to my office opened, I turned around to look at one of the most unpleasant sights I'd ever been faced with. Standing in the door was something that looked human, and I used the term human only because I stuck around long enough to find out for sure. He was about six feet and well-dressed, in a dark gray overcoat. But his face raised goosebumps from my argyles to my haircut. It was as dark gray as his overcoat, his whole face, his eyes, his lips, and when he spoke, even his tongue. Mr. Diamond? Yeah? I want you to find the man, and I want you to find him in the next five hours. He didn't sit down. He just stood there facing me like a bad dream. I pushed the chair back and got up, as though I had to be standing to protect myself from what was coming. The man I want you to find is named Carnes. He's a science teacher at State College. Is he missing? Would I want him located if he wasn't? Would I have asked you if I'd known the answer to that? How much is your fee, Mr. Diamond? When I know what I'm getting into, a hundred a day and expenses. Yes, five hundred. Find Lewis Carnes in five hours and you get another five hundred. Does it matter if you know what you're getting into? I never go waiting if there's quicksand around. Not even for a thousand dollars? I never like to count money when I'm suffocating. You only have to find Lewis Carnes. I guarantee you'll live through it. And after I find him? You can spend your thousand and forget about it. Why do you want him found? I owe him a debt. I want to pay him. And why do I have to find him in the next five hours? Because that's how long I've got to live. Interesting situation? You bet. And that thousand made it about as interesting a situation as I'd ever gotten into. I couldn't take my eyes off of him, standing there as gray as an early morning ghost. I wanted to ask him about his color. But in a business like mine, if a client comes in riding a purple llama, you greet him like everybody rides purple llamas and keep your mouth shut. He handed me the $500 and a card with his business address on it. Roger Vegas. 64 West 110th, studio of modern photography. He backed up two steps, smiled a slow, dead smile, turned and walked out of the office like he was going to look at his own grave. I sat back down and thought about it for a while, and the little voice in the back of my head kept whispering, Don't do it, Diamond. 
Don't do it, Diamond. Don't do it, Diamond. Oh, shut up. You'll be sorry. What about the thousand dollars? It'll buy you a nice funeral. wall. Eh, uh, peasant. <laughs> It ain't Richard Diamond, the overstuffed flatfoot. Well, if it ain't Sergeant Otis, the overstuffed flathead. Oh, no. Someday you'll be sorry. Well, everybody is sooner or later. Think of what your poor mother must have gone through. That ain't funny. I'll bet your father didn't think so either. Oh. Oh, Rick. Still picking on him? Oh, uh, he'll be picked on until somebody plucks off that other head. What's up? Uh, Walter wants some information. If I can? History on a fellow named Roger Vegas... Here's his card. Also, Mr. Lewis Kynes, science professor at State College. Well, I'll try. What's it all about? Roger Vegas wants me to find this Lewis Kynes. Wants to pay back a debt. What's unusual about that? I don't know. Oh, but you should see Roger Vegas. He'd scare you right into a dozen more ulcers. I doubt it. No room for any more. Well, the ones you've got would hide. You should see this guy, Walt. His face, his, his, his hands are duck gray. What about the rest of them? Now, wouldn't you know it if I got to ask him to take his clothes off? Very funny. What do you mean he's gray? Well, that's just what he is. Even his eyes. Not just the pupil, but the whole eye. The whole eye? Yeah. If he raised his collar, he could stick out his tongue, put a tie pen on it, and wear it with a dark blue suit. His tongue, too? Even his fingernails, his gums. I suppose his hair is plaid. Okay, okay. But if you ever run into this guy in a dark alley, get set to faint. Well, I'll see what I can find out about him. I've got to have the information pretty fast. I've only got four and a half hours to find Lewis Carnes. How come? Because Roger Vegas has only got that long to live. Rick. That's what he told me. A guy with a gray face comes into your office, wants you to find another guy, and tells you you've got to find him in the next four and a half hours because he's going to die. Who's going to die? The guy with the gray face. You didn't say that. You said got to find the guy in the next four and a half hours because he's going to die. Oh, well, you know what I meant. No, no. Vegas gave me five hours. You said four and a half. Well, that was a half an hour ago. Oh, swell. Oh, I'm wasting my time. I've got to find him. The man with the gray face? No, the science professor. Well, you're getting pretty confused. I'll see you later, huh? I left the 5th precinct, grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was walking across the campus of State College. Being Saturday, the big school was quiet and impressive as it stretched out over the dozen acres of snow-covered grounds. I located the administration building and found one lonely student working in the main office. Uh, Ahem. Yes? Oh. Good afternoon. Looks like it might be. Can I do something for you? Well, uh, yes. I'm I'm looking for Professor Carnes. Professor Carnes? Mm-hmm. He's uh, in the science department, isn't he? The professor hasn't been on campus since last Thursday. Faculty's been rather worried. You don't know where I could find him? No, but I'm through here in half an hour. I could help you look. <laughs> I bet you could. You know where the professor lives? It's on file. Well, why don't you be a good little freshman? A junior. And a junior, and get me his address from that file. Because it's more fun not being a good little junior. And the college has certain rules. Well, then be a bad little junior and break the rules. I'm off in half an hour. Might be able to then. I've got to find a science professor, dear. And until I do, I'm afraid I'll have to pass the extension course in biology. And if you find the professor? Uh, we'll talk about it. I'm in here every afternoon. Hmm. College hasn't changed a bit since my days. Just jumped into second gear. The cute little junior walked her sweater and saddle shoes over to a long file and came back with Professor Kahn's home address. I thanked her, promised she could wear my gold badge if she passed lunch hour, and took my cab back to town. At the professor's house, I met his sister, an elderly lady named Drusilla, who reminded me of my math teacher at PS14. I haven't seen my brother since Friday morning, Mr. Diamond. And you have no idea where I can find him? No. Why do you want to find him? Well, I, uh, I'm a private detective, Miss Carnes. I, I was hired by a man named Vegas. Oh, you know him? I most certainly do. Did he hire you to find my brother? That's right. He's not a good man, Mr. Diamond. I believe he's the reason my brother disappeared. 
Maybe you better tell me about it. My brother married a girl many years younger than himself, and unfortunately, it was not a good marriage. Did this Vegas person mention my brother's wife? No, he just told me he wanted to find the professor in order to pay him a debt. A debt? That's what he said. Watch out for that man, Mr. Diamond. He broke up my brother's marriage. Well, uh, maybe I'd better talk to your brother's wife. That would be impossible. My brother's wife killed herself. Oh, well, that's uh, too bad. My brother and I believe she killed herself because of that man, Vegas. My brother found out they were seeing each other. When he begged her to stop, she said that it was impossible and refused to give a reason. A week later, she killed herself. Have you ever seen Mr. Vegas? No, I have not. Why? Well, I was just wondering why any woman would go for a man like him. Unless she liked ghosts. I left Drusilla Kynes and looked at my watch. It was three o'clock and I had only two hours left to find the professor and earn my thousand dollars. On the way to the nearest phone booth... I thought about the case and wondered if the thousand dollars would be worth it in the long run. I watched part of my last five bucks drop in the phone and decided it was. Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Diamond, Walt. I want to know about a suicide. Otis won't do it. Uh, Professor Carnes' wife. I thought so. I checked for you in Vegas and the professor. The professor's wife jumped off a building five days ago. What did you find out about Vegas and the professor? Not much. At the inquest, the professor accused Vegas of breaking up his home and driving his wife to suicide. Neither man's got a record. Vegas is a professional photographer, and the professor has been teaching at State College for the past 11 years. I talked with some of the men at the inquest, and they remembered Vegas. They all say his skin looked pretty healthy at the time. Do me a favor, Walt. Check with the coroner and find out what would turn a man's skin that color. Sure. Got any leads on the professor yet? No, but I got a hunch. I just left his sister's, and uh, she doesn't seem at all worried about her brother's disappearance. So? So if she isn't worried, there's a good chance she knows he's all right. And if she knows he's all right, she might know where he is. Oh, no wonder they made you a Lieutenant Walt. You keep thinking like that, and someday you might even take over for Sergeant Otis. Bye. <laughs> I left the phone booth and walked back toward Drusilla Kahn's house. I staked myself out across the street in a corner gas station and warmed my blue little ears inside while I waited for the good Drusilla to contact her brother. I was just guessing, but it worked. Ten minutes later, Drusilla, dressed in a heavy fur coat that looked like it should be out on the river building a dam, walked out of her house and hailed a cab. I hailed one, too, and followed. Fifteen minutes later, I was back on the campus of State College. I watched her get out, walk around back of one of the buildings, knock on the door. She waited until someone opened it, and then she disappeared inside. I tried the door, but it was locked again. So I toured the building. The front door was locked, too. I set to work trying to pick the lock. I broke a Boy Scout knife, half a dozen fingernails, and several bobby pins that for some strange reason had found their way into my coat pocket. So I did the next best thing. I went back to the door that Drusilla had entered earlier and waited. Five frozen minutes later, the door opened and I stood there facing Drusilla while her look melted every icicle within ten feet. Standing directly behind her was a small man, his breath showing clearly against the cold air, coming in short gasps. Drusilla. It's all right, Lewis. What do you want, Mr. Diamond? Nothing now, Miss Carnes. I found it. Is that the man, Drusilla? Yes. He's a detective. Vegas hired him. It's all right, Drusilla. If Vegas wants to find me, I'm tired of hiding. Tell Vegas that I'll be waiting here, young man. Lewis, you know what he'll do. It's all right. Vegas knows he's only got a few hours left. Has that strange color of his skin got something to do with it? Yes. Have you seen him since the inquest, Professor? No. Well, that's funny. How did you know about his skin and that he only has a few hours left to live? Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here's an important question. What do you look for in a cigarette? 
Well, most people say flavor and mildness. Those are two things you'll find in camels. No other cigarette has camels' rich, full flavor. The flavor of costly tobaccos, properly aged and expertly blended. And no other cigarette gives you this conclusive evidence of mildness. In a coast-to-coast test, hundreds of people smoked only camels for 30 days. Each week, noted throat specialists examined the throats of these smokers and reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Yes, that's proof of mildness based on day-in, day-out smoking, not just a sniff or a puff. Make your own 30-day camel mildness test, the sensible test, the thorough test. You'll enjoy camel's rich, full flavor from first puff to last. You'll see just how mild camels are, and you'll know why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel dirty day test, and you'll see. Smoke camel and see. And now back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. <laughs> Well, I'd found the professor and the thousand dollars was close to being mine. All I had to do was notify Vegas and collect. Even the professor guaranteed to help by staying and waiting for Vegas. But something was wrong. Standing there in the snow, looking at the timid professor, something began to smell to high heaven. I turned and walked away. Even if the professor was going to run, what was I supposed to do? carry him piggyback until I located my dying client. The thousand was important, but there was a lot more that had to be solved in a hurry. I went back to town and over to the photography shop run by Roger Vegas. Yeah, there's something. What's the matter? Huh? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Uh, can I do something for him? I'm looking for Roger Vegas. Oh, he ain't in. And I seen you someplace. You might have. I move around. Where can I find Vegas? He ain't here. I know he ain't. Where can I find him? Home, I guess. Home. That would be somewhere in New York, huh? I, uh, I supposed to give out the address. Uh, who wants him? I do, and I ain't supposed to give out the name. Uh, you're pretty sharp. Sharp guy, huh? Tell him to call Richard Diamond. Rich? Richard Diamond. My family thought it up. Okay. You know me now? No. No, I was mistaken. Well, I'm surprised. I sent you to Sing Sing ten years ago. The professor's hiding in the school? That's right, Walt. In the basement of the science building. I just left Roger Vegas' photography shop, and guess who was working there? Who? George Youngwell. Youngwell? The guy you sent up on that blackmail rap. Ten years ago. Well, I knew he was out, but I haven't heard anything about him in a couple of years. Well, he's working for Vegas. Must be keeping his nose clean. Oh, I've seen cleaner noses on pigs. Somebody want me? No. What is it, you melon head? Well, gee, don't yell at me like that. I got something more than Roger Vegas. Well, do you want to hand it to me, or would you just like to stand there and throw it? Oh. Gee, I wish you'd stay away from Diamond. Every time you see him, you get meaner and meaner. Come on, come on. What do you got? Here. Ain't nothing much. Robbery detail come up with it. Huh. That photography shop was broken into this morning, Rick. What oh, it was? A uh, burglary got some prints on the windows. Belongs to some guy named Carnes. Carnes? Yeah. Says here, checked prints with State License Bureau. Prints belong to one Lewis Carnes, professor of science at State College. I'll see you later. Rick. Yeah? I nearly forgot. I checked with the coroner, told him about the color of Vegas' skin. He said that it could only be caused by a strong dose of silver salts. Silver salts? Poisoning known as perinia. P-Y-R-I-N-N-I-A. Silver salts. Uh They used that in a photography shop. Coroner said a man would have to drink about 30 grains for a fatal dosage. That's quite a bit. Hmm. Can tell you how long he'd live? Yeah, anywhere from six to eight hours, according to the dosage. First, the victim turns gray, 
Then green. About what time was that photography shop broken into, Walt? Oh, sometime before nine this morning. Before they opened up. Mm, thanks. Where are you going? Going to talk to George Youngwell and then find out if my gray client has turned green yet. Hello, George. I told him, Diamond. I told him you wanted to see him. He said he was going over to your office. Oh, thanks. Look, what are you looking at me like that for? I'm going straight now. Swell. I got a good job, see? Legit. I don't want no trouble. I don't blame you. Okay. Mr. Vegas has gone over to your place. Why don't you go meet him, huh? Plenty of time. Look, he's in a hurry. He's got a big trouble, and he's got to take care of it in a hurry. Yeah, I know. He's got about an hour. Well, go on, go on. He paid you, didn't he? What do you do around here, George? Now, listen. Listen, you. I know my rights. I'm clean. I don't know what you're trying to prove, but I don't buy none of it. Now, get out of here, or I'll call a straight cop. You know why Vegas is going to die in an hour, George? Yeah. No, no, I don't. If I did, I don't have to tell you nothing. Nothing, see? Maybe you know why he wants to find the professor. No. Maybe you knew the professor's wife. No. Maybe you know why she got killed. No, no, no. Get out of here, Diamond. Get out. I'm clean. I'm legit now. Yeah, like a tub of mud. What do you mean? I want you to tell me about Vegas. What about him? What about him? He owns the shop, that's all. He makes pictures. What else does he do? Nothing, nothing that I know of. What else he does, I don't know about. What are you doing? Get away from me. I want to know all about it, George. I think I know most of it. I want to know the rest. No, I don't know. No, get away. I'm not a cop anymore, remember? I don't have to play the rules. You can't scare me. You won't get rough. You ain't a cop. It's right to lock you up if you get rough. Get away. I want to know why the professor's wife got killed. I don't know. I swear. I don't know. She she, she jumped. She jumped off the building. I thought you said you didn't know. Get away. No, please. Please. I could figure everything but the wife. If she jumped, she had to have a reason. When I saw you, George, I got the idea. Please, please. Blackmail, maybe, George. I'm legit, I told you. I'm working Blackmail here. Blackmail with pictures, maybe? No, no. The dirtiest racket in the business. I mean, no. You're going to tell me, George, I wish you were dead. I'm not telling you anything. Blackmail's the dirtiest racket I can think of. No, please, please. Please. If Vegas finds the professor, you'll kill him. I've got an hour to stop a murder. Oh, oh, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, we were blackmailing the wife. Phony pictures? Yeah. How many others? How many others? A lot of them. Lots. Okay, George. Let's get out of the station. I hate to get in the rut, but I'm going to see that you get another ten years. I hauled George Youngwell down to the precinct and went back to see the professor. He gave me some very interesting information. Interesting enough to make me call Walt and set up a plan. Then I went back to my office. When I walked in, I found Roger Vegas facing me. He turned an ugly shade of green, all but the gun in his hand. Where is he, Diamond? I've got less than an hour. I just left George Youngwell at the 5th Precinct. He's singing like a quartet. I thought that would happen, but I'm not worried. You've got plenty of poison, huh? That's right. You had it for about seven and a half hours, ever since the professor broke into your store and made you drink the silver sauce. Yes. He was getting even for his wife. I've got about 40 minutes to live. Where is he? Well, if you're short on time, maybe you'd better start looking. No, I don't think so. You're going to show me. No, I don't think so. I can't argue. I guess you won't live through it after all. Oh, no. Wait a minute. Let's not lose our heads. He's uh, at the college. Don't lie to me. He's in the science building, in the basement. You're coming along. It'll take 30 minutes to get there. If you're lying, I've got five minutes left to kill you. I think that's plenty of time. The professor's in this building. Is it open? It should be. Go ahead. Stop. I can't see anything. The lights are out. If you're lying to me, Diamond, if he's not here... He's here. Call him. Okay. Well, Professor. Professor Carnes. Yes? Oh. He's in the back room. Tell him to come in. Will you come in here, Professor? Who is it? It's Diamond. The detective? Get him in here. Yes, Professor. All right. Yes, what is it, Mr. Diamond? I... Hello, Professor. Vegas. Yes. Surprise. No. 
No, I knew you'd hired this detective. I knew you'd come. Not too late, eh? All right, Professor. I've got but five minutes, so you're going to die before me. You're a pretty terrible man. Look who's talking. Break into my store, pull a gun on me, make me drink that stuff. You're a killer and you're going to pay for it? I'm not a killer yet. I haven't got the time to talk about it. You won't get away with it. You think you pulled it off just great, don't you? Well, I'm not only going to kill you, but I'm going to tell you something. I want to see how you take it. I got a little additional revenge, Professor. Your wife didn't jump. I pushed her. I don't believe it. She was going to stop paying me. Going to tell you about the pictures I was blackmailing with. But I couldn't have that. So I pushed her off the roof. That's all I wanted to know, Vegas. What do you mean? Walt. Very nice, Lieutenant Levinson. Here's his gun. Thank you, Mr. Diamond. Get up, Vegas. You cheated me. But you've got to take him. He made me drink this stuff. Oh, relax. You're going to be all right. Crazy. I'm going to die, but he'll be the murderer. To little satisfaction anyway. You'll hang, Professor. Tell him, Professor. You lose all the way around, Vegas. What do you mean? It takes 30 grains of silver salt to be fatal. I only gave you 15. No. Oh. In another few hours, you return to your natural color. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh. Don't be so unhappy, Vegas. You tried so hard to die, I think the state will do everything they can to see that you make it. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. And among the millions of camel smokers are many stars who know the importance of mildness in a cigarette because their voices are their living. Our own Dick Powell has been a camel smoker for a good long time. Is that right, Dick? Yes, it is, Ed, and I'm smoking one right now. Well, you're in good company. Among other stars who smoke camels are John Wayne, Risa Stevens, Ezio Pinza, Martha Tilton, and so on. Friends, find out for yourself how mild and flavorful a cigarette can be. Make the camel 30-day test, and you'll know why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test, and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. You know, ladies and gentlemen, no one deserves our appreciation more than the hospitalized men and women of our armed forces. As a tribute to them, the camel people send gift cigarettes each week to servicemen's and veterans' hospitals in this country and also to overseas where our fighting men are hospitalized. This week, camels go to veterans' hospitals, American Lake, Washington, and Fort Bayard, New Mexico, U.S. Army Station Hospital, Camp Stoneman, California. U.S. Naval Hospital Ship, Repose. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Dick Powell will soon be seen in the RKO picture, Cry Danger. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, and Arthur Q. Bryan. Men for pipe pleasure, yet the national joy smoke, Prince Albert. P.A. has a rich flavor and wonderful natural fragrance. It's crimp cut for cool, smooth smoking, and specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. You'll enjoy Prince Albert, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. This, I believe, Mr. Robert D. Morrow is an educator. Born in Pawnee City, Nebraska, he now lives and works in Arizona, where tourists and residents alike are attracted by such natural wonders as the petrified forest, the Grand Canyon, the desert, and Boulder Dam, one of the man-made wonders. Mr. Morrow 
has served on the State Board of Education and was president of the Arizona Administrators Association. He was the superintendent of the State School for the Deaf and Blind for nine years, and he is active in community organizations. For the past 11 years, he has been the superintendent of the Tucson Public Schools. Hear now the beliefs of Robert Morrow. I believe that the greatest pleasures in life come from simple things. A desert flower, a shaded babbling brook, a friendly good morning, a beautiful painting, solitude, the song of a bird, or even more plebeian things such as hot biscuits and honey or a glass of cold milk after a long hot hike. It always thrilled my wife and me when our young daughter brought us a beautiful flower or our son took time out from a ball game to call us to see a beautiful sunset. My father died when I was three, and no one ever worked harder than my mother to provide for us. Our home was simple but clean and attractive. When we got home from school or work, mother was always there, and never too busy nor too tired to talk with us. Saturday was bake day, and there were always cookies, cinnamon rolls, pies and cakes for us and any friends we wanted to bring home. After church and a big Sunday dinner, we often took long walks in the woods in search of wildflowers. I started working before I started to school and have worked for many fine people. I may be a bit old-fashioned, but I believe a job worth doing is worth doing well, that it pays to do more than I'm asked to do or am paid for doing, that I can take myself too seriously, but I cannot take my job too seriously. Along the way, I've also found that difficult tasks are made easy, if I pitch in and work, and that a really tough job should never be put off. If I procrastinate, they really do get tough. My wife and I have always had fun working together with our hands, with our heads, and with our hearts. The therapeutic value of creative work, the search for truth, and the stimulation of old and new friends are all of inestimable value. It seems to me that the greatest satisfaction that any of us can get out of life is in helping others, especially helping others to help themselves. Some people have a holier-than-thou or a do-gooder attitude, but a vast majority of the people I know in all walks of life are kind, generous, and cooperative. Time is running out, and there's yet so much I want to say. Twelve days before our son would have been sixteen, he died in an accident, which probably could have been prevented. He was everything I had ever dreamed or hoped the son could be. The whole world ended for a long, long time. I have learned to live with the hurt as many others have done, a minute at a time, an hour at a time, a day at a time. There's no need to go further. I'm most thankful that this accident hasn't made me bitter. It has strengthened my belief in God, in the inherent goodness of people, in the importance of the little and simple things in life, in the unimportance of much that is material. I frequently fail, often stumble, but I do believe that in spite of all the crassness, misery, and wretchedness that seem to abound, this is a good world. If we halfway try, it can be an infinitely better world for all people everywhere. That was Mr. Robert D. Morrow, the superintendent of the Tucson Public Schools in Arizona. His optimistic faith and his belief in the simple pleasures of life are perhaps cues to living a rich and contented life. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor.
And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A district attorney learns that in every man's mind there is a secret compartment. It can be the hiding place for guilt or for fear. And fear is a deadly enemy of justice. Take this case. It started at 1 o'clock in the morning in the shadows of a waterfront pier. All right, start it up. Where'd you get this heap from, Crow? That's my business. Looks later, you just drive. Let me do the thinking. Ah, you do the thinking, I do the dirty work. Is that it? You want to keep working, Slater? You want a brass checker to my shape up? All right, all right. If Rimlinger isn't straightened out, I'm going to be finished. And no stumble bummer like him is going to finish any crew. All right, turn down River Street. You'll be leaving the pier in two minutes. Suppose somebody sees us, Crow. Who's going to see us? He's the only longshoreman I got working on that dock tonight. He'll be coming out alone. Get him in the middle of the street. It's nice and wide. He'll have nothing to duck behind. Better slow down a little. All right. Now, be careful on this stretch. Hey, this thing's sliding all over. Why do you think I told you to slow down? The oil truck turned over here last night. They put sand and gravel on it, but it's still slippery. Watch it now. Pier 37, just past the ferry shed. There's people in that ferry shed, Crow. They're not close enough to bother us. Watch the street. Hey, there. There he is now. Let him walk further into the street. Now, gun it. He stopped, Crow. He'll let you go by. Perfect. Cut into him. Keep going. Think we got him? We knocked him a hundred feet later. But the front of the car's all smashed. So what? I'll give the kid a hundred bucks to have it fixed. That's getting rid of Rimlinger pretty cheap. And the newspapers ain't going to try to pin this one on any crew. I can see the headlines now. Longshoreman killed in hit-and-run accident. <laughs> Keep in this office, Miss Miller. He's waiting for you, Harrington. Go right in. Hi, Chief. How'd you make out? Lab identified the hot route we found at the Midtown Garage. It's the one, all right. Any line on the owner? Yeah. We picked him up. A newsboy, 16 years old. Name's Jimmy Leonard. I got him down to the detention room now. You want to see him? Yes. I'll be down in the detention room, Miss Miller. Yes, sir. What's the boy's background, Hank? He lives with his father. Cold water walk up on the east side. No trouble with the police before. As a matter of fact... What? He peddles his papers near the 9th Precinct house, Chief. Every cop in the place swears by him. They don't think he'd do a thing like this. It's his car, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. He keeps it in a public garage near the paper. Says when he went in this morning, a fender and a headlight was smashed up. We picked him up when he took it to a body shop to have it fixed. Four, please. This Leonard kid's hot rod isn't the only one in town, Chief. Half the kids who peddle papers own cars just like it. But not with a smashed fender. Well, somebody might have backed into it in the garage. Kid says he didn't rob it last night. And I believe him. Sure you're not being influenced by the opinions of the men in the ninth precinct? Yeah, it takes somebody pretty cold-blooded to run a man down and then beat it without stopping to help. And this kid, he, well, he just isn't cold-blooded. Sixteen-year-olds can do a lot of foolish things when they're frightened. Oh, here we are. All right, Mike, open up for Mr. Garrett. Thanks, Mike. Jimmy Lennon? Yes, sir. My name is Garrett. I'm the district attorney, Jimmy. He'll help you if he can, boy. Just be honest with him. We'd like to know where you were last night. I already told him I was home. Your father says you weren't. Maybe I, maybe he didn't hear me come in. He was sleeping. I, I, I guess I got up this morning before he was awake. Mm-hmm. The man who was killed was struck down just after 1 a.m. Can you tell us where you were then? No. 
If you're hiding something to protect yourself, son, you're being very foolish. If you're trying to cover up for somebody else, you're being even more foolish. I don't want to say no more, that's all. I just can't tell you. Why don't you go away? Why don't you leave me alone? Your father says you weren't home all night. Not since you left the cell papers yesterday afternoon. Jimmy, did you ever lend your car to anybody? There's anyone else in the habit of using it. Anybody who might have a duplicate of the ignition key. No. I, w- I was the only one who ever drove it. Only assembled the car a month ago. You made it yourself? Yeah, a bunch of us made them. We all chipped in and bought parts so we could get them, you know, whole- wholesale. Mm-hmm. Any of the other newsies keep their car in the same garage, right near the paper? Yeah. Rembrandt, I don't know his real name. Guys call him Rembrandt because he goes to an art school at night. And, the- and Frankie Cutter. They're the only ones. Is that all you can tell us? Yeah. It's no use, Harrington. Come on. Lock him in, Mike. Now sit down and get a car. Where to? I want to talk to the other newsies who keep their hot rods at the Midtown Garage. Well, that kid they called Rembrandt was no help, Chief. No, he wasn't. But I still want to see that other newsboy, Frankie Cutter. Did you find out where his stand is? Yeah, 12th and Madison, but he won't be there. Well, why not? He works the corner nights. Somebody else has it for the daytime. He lives over this way in Tenement Row, a couple of blocks from the Rimlinger place. I've got to see Rimlinger's wife sooner or later. Maybe I'd better go over there while you're talking to Cutter. Oh, give me the address. Hey, uh, it's written down here. Ground floor flat. Should be the next week to the right. Where good night, so he'll probably be sleeping. Oh, drop me at the corner. <sighs> Sorry to wake you up, Frankie. Yeah, those kids in the street wake everybody up anyhow. So Jimmy Leonard's in kind of a jam, huh? A bad jam, Frankie. I understand you've got a car just like his. Sure. A bunch of us got him. We all made them together. You garage them in the same place, too. Got to keep them someplace. What a racket. Eight bucks a month garage rent. I could leave it in the street and save the dough, but the cops keep slapping tickets on it. These your keys on the dresser? Yeah. This your pair of dice, too? Oh, yeah. I must have left them out without thinking. Shove them in the top drawer for me, will you? Thanks. My old lady spotted those. She'd scream like an eagle. Frankie, did you happen to see Jimmy Leonard any place last night? No. Why? You say I did? No. Now, where was your car during the night? Last night while you were working, I mean. Was it in the garage? Where else? Is it there now? Of course it's there now. Rembrandt's, too. Well, thank you, Frankie. That's all I want to know for now. You don't have to go through the kitchen. The other door leads right into the hallway. <laughs> this is supposed to be a parlor. Some laugh, huh? A parlor in this rat trap. Thanks. Why don't you stick around for a few minutes? You being the DA got the old lady all excited. She went out to get some breakfast rolls. She'll fix some coffee or something. I'm afraid not, Frankie. Well, thank your mother for me. Tell her some other time. You're the boss. So long. So long, Frankie. You'd be back so soon. How did Rimlinger's wife take it? Hard. A couple of neighbors with her now. Yeah, she'll be all right, I guess, if she isn't left alone. Two cute kids. Oh, uh, I'd like to stop by the precinct house. Right. The Rimlingers need some help on the police fund. He left no insurance, nothing. And he gets killed coming home from work last night. The first work he's had in three months. Three months? Long Shawman should be busier than that. Plenty of shipping. Yeah, I know. But his wife said he'd had some kind of a beef with the hiring boss, something like that. Anyhow, he was laid off for quite a while, until yesterday. The local union had a meeting yesterday afternoon, and he was elected delegate. I guess that helped him to get working again. Yes. Yes, it did. For one night. Harrington, I want you to check the license plates on Jimmy Leonard's car. Compare them with registration. Make sure the motor number is right. Why? Rembrandt and Frankie Cutter have cars exactly like Jimmy's. One of them might have switched parking stalls and license plates. I want to make certain that Jimmy's car is Jimmy's car. His key fit the damaged car, Chief. He drove it out to a repair shop. 
Fellow can always sell his own car, even for mothers like it. You know that. No, I don't, Harrington. As a matter of fact, at this point, I'm beginning to wonder whether we can tell a case of hit-and-run manslaughter from murder. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the hot rod killing, here is an important message I'd like you to hear. And now, back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A longshoreman had been killed by a hit-and-run hot rod driver. The car had been located, but the 16-year-old owner would neither admit guilt nor speak in his own defense. While Harrington was continuing to check on the death car, I went to see the boy's father. I told him. I told him a hundred times. If I told him once, that car would get him into trouble. Now, where is he? Behind bars. If I get my hands on him, I'll break his neck. You're talking about your own son, Mr. Leonard. What kind of a father are you? The kind of a father he should have listened to. I've been too easy with him. Just like his mother was. Blood will tell. That's what she'd do, too. Kill a man and run. Never had the guts to face anything. He's a 16-year-old boy, Mr. Leonard. He's alone, and he's frightened. <laughs> he may go to the reformatory for five years. Doesn't that mean anything to you? No! I never should have kept him. She wanted him. She couldn't get him. Not when I got finished with that divorce court. You mean you divorced your wife and you got custody of the boy? Yes. I was too smart for her. You took him away from his mother? I did everything for him. Tried to make something out of him. How could anything like that happen in the name of justice? What do you mean by that crack? You never wanted that boy. I took care of him. Made a home for him. You took him so you could do just what you have done. You took him so you could punish him. So you could use him to revenge yourself on his mother. So you could ruin both their lives and separate them for your own satisfaction. To appease your petty vanity for whatever you think your wife did to you. Get out of here. You're not going to talk to me like that in my own house, even if you are the district attorney. Go on, get out! And when you see that son of mine, tell him I hope they keep him in jail forever. Tell him I hope he rots there! He'll never rot the way he might have rotted here. If your boy is guilty, I know who should really go on trial. A reformatory won't hurt him. Compared to the home you've given him, his life there will be a paradise. Yeah? Excuse me, but is Mr. Garrett here? I'm from the He's office. just leaving. Hello, Miss Miller. There was no phone listed for here, so I can... We can talk that. outside. Mr. Leonard was right. I'm just leaving. Well, does he blame you because the boy's in trouble? No, he blames the world for whatever trouble he has inside himself. Well, why did you come after me? Well, as I said, there was no phone list for Leonard. Some of the policemen at the ninth precinct were trying to help Jimmy. Yes? One of them found out where he was last night. Where? Well, it's kind of strange. They found out from another newsboy who has a stand near the park district. Saw Jimmy going to the Saverin Plaza Hotel. They checked with the desk clerk. The boy was registered there. Jimmy Leonard registered there at the Saverin Plaza. That's one of the best hotels in town. The desk clerk says he comes there one night every month, always on the 15th of the month. Do you know why? No. Have you heard from Harrington? Yes. Registration and serial number match Jimmy's car, all right. Well, where is Harrington now? Well, he said to tell you he was going down to the docks, near where Remlinger was killed. Now, how did you get here? By cab. Good. Take another one going back. Make out an expense voucher. Couldn't I ride back with you? I'm going to stop at the docks and meet Harrington. Well, there's a couple of things I want you to do. Yes, sir. Get the cop that found out Jimmy was registered at the Sovereign Plaza. Tell him to go back to the hotel and check the register for the past year. See if he can find one other particular name besides Jimmy's that appears on the register for the 15th of each month. Get the name, find out who it is and where they come from. Yes, sir. And then go into the civil court's records. About ten years back, I want a transcript of a divorce case. Leonard versus Leonard. Have it all at my office by the time I get back. Yes, sir. See you there. Talking to me? Who do you think I'm talking to? 
Docks ain't no place for sightseeing. Voice and everything you might get hurt. Why don't you just blow out of here? You any crow, the hiring boss? Yeah. Say, you must be the guy that's been nosing around here asking the longshoremen questions. Yeah, that's right. You shouldn't do that. Those guys got work to do. So have I. Oh, DA's office, huh? Uh, working on that hit run case, huh? The guy that got killed, uh, Fred Rimlinger? Yeah, that's right. Well, none of my boys know nothing about that. Poor Fred. I just sent some flowers. Bad thing, the poor guy getting killed like that, leaving a family. I'd bleed for him. Bleed what? Ice water? You're a pretty fresh guy, ain't you? I've been talking to your men, the few that ain't afraid to talk. Troublemakers? <laughs> What'd they tell you? And you make them kick back 20% of their pay every time you hand them a brass work check at the shape of And they don't like it. Well, you think you can get one of them to say that in court? Rimlinger didn't like it either. He'd have said so in court. That's why the men elected him delegate. And you gave him a brass check for the first time in three months. He gave him the only night job on the dock. And he got killed on the way home. By a hot rod driven by a crazy kid. You blaming me for that? Something wrong there, Ernie? Yes, Slater. Come here. This flatfoot's been going around the dock, stirring up the men, keeping them from working, making cracks about why Remlinger got killed. Who's this, one of your muscle boys? He's a guard for troublemakers. Now, why don't you hit the road? I think this has gone far enough, gentlemen. Gee, where did you come from? I've been behind those bales for the past two minutes, listening to your very enlightening conversation. You gentlemen have any plans for Mr. Harrington? No. Oh, of course not, Mr. Garrett, but uh, you ought to tell him to be careful about believing what he hears from troublemakers. He shouldn't repeat it. A guy like you has to stand for re-election every once in a while. I know you wouldn't want a taxpayer like me making complaints. I got a lot of connections. I think I'll be able to get by when election day comes without you or your connections. Come on, Hank. Where'd you leave your car? Right over here, under the shed. Where's yours? A couple of blocks down. You can take me to it. Yeah, sure. Which way? Turn right when we reach the street. Not past the ferry slip. That, uh, that hiring boss crawl. I think he knows something about the rimbling and killing. Yes, well, we can't prove it. If only Jimmy Leonard would talk. Or if he'd been able to find a car switch. There was no switch. It was his car. He was the only one who could have been driving it. He took... Look out, Harrington! That screwball almost skidded right into us. Yeah, it wasn't his fault. This road. Uh, slippery. Oil truck turned over here day before yesterday. They tried to cover it. Hey, you hear that sand and gravel kicking up under the fenders? Yeah, I hear it. Never mind my car, Harrington. Turn south to the Midtown Garage. Watch up. That car that killed Rimlinger must have come through that oil slick and gravel. Yeah? Then the death car will be bound to have some oily sand and gravel stuck under all four fenders. I want to see Rembrandt's car and Frankie Cutter's. Hurry. Normal road cars. No sand or oil. Have a look at Cutter's. No. Well, well, this one's okay, too. It's... It... Hey, wait a minute. Let me get this flashlight focused. Well? That's funny. Hey, give me a hand out, will you, Chief? Sure. <clears throat> what did you find? Well, right front fender is clean underneath. But the left front and the two rear fenders are covered with oil and sand. That's what I was looking for. Cutter's car is the one that killed Rimlinger. But Jimmy Lennon's car has the smash fender and headlight. Because the right front fender and the headlight from this car were taken off and switched for the fender and headlight on Jimmy's. That's why the underside of this fender is clean and the other three aren't. There a phone here? Yeah. I saw the garage man using one in that little office over there. Thank you. 
Lenny's office. Mr. Garrett, Miss Miller. Oh, Mr. Garrett, Jimmy Leonard's mother's here waiting for you. What? Yes, sir. She just came in on the train from upstate. She heard about his arrest on the radio. Her name's Mrs. Goodrich now. She's remarried. I see. Well, there's something else. Her name has been on the Saverin Plaza Hotel Register the 15th of every month, the same as Jimmy Leonard's. She said he's been meeting her there, so his father wouldn't know. I thought it was something like that. Tell her to wait. Harrington and I are going down to pick up Frankie Cutter. Meanwhile, call Homicide and tell them I want a plain clothes squad to meet me at the River Street Ferry Shed in about a half hour. Tell them to wait. <coughs> Let's get Cutter. Where are you taking me? I didn't kill the guy, I tell you. Hey, what are we doing down here by the docks? There ain't no police station on River Street. You know what we're doing here, Frankie. You want to tell us who was using your car? Or shall we tell you? You know, don't you? It was Ernie Kroll, wasn't it? Better answer, Frankie. Yeah. He came by the stand. Wanted to know could he borrow the car. To a guy like him, you don't say no. So I give him the keys. What time? Midnight. I was just going to eat. Then he brings the heat back about 2 a.m. Tells me he had an accident. Give me a C note to have it fixed and keep my trap shut. I I thought I'd keep it all, so I glommed onto the fenders and light from Jimmy's car. You want me to drive right on to the dock, Chief? Yes. A lot of guys walking up. Long Sharman finishing their shift. Climb into the back, Frankie. Get on the floor and stay there. Don't worry, mister. I don't want no trouble. Stop here. There's Crow by the hiring shed. Yeah, and that muscle boy Slater, paying off and taking a kickback. Too money, happy to see us. And they'll see us in a minute. Morgan, turn your squad out along the dock. Nobody gets off this pier. Don't try to take them in peacefully, Hyden. I don't want any of the workmen to get hurt. I'm with you. All right, Crow. Business is over for the day. What are you guys doing back here? You're under arrest for the murder of Fred Rimlinger. Slater, come here. Huh? What are you guys trying to pull? We're not trying to pull anything. We have a confession from a newsboy whose car you used, Crow. A, a, a confession? I didn't drive the car. I just borrowed it. Who did drive it? Don't move for a gun, Slater. Stay back, Copper. Way back. We got six men on this pier. If you get by me, tell Slater to drop that gun. Hit, drop it, Slater. Do it before they kill us. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're coming. All right, you men. The law can handle them. They'll get all they deserve. And from now on... You men will get all you deserve. A full day's pay with no kickbacks. Let's go, Harrington. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoyed this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here is the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Jimmy Leonard's father tried to regain custody of the boy, but the court reversed its original decision when the true facts were presented. Meanwhile, hiring boss Ernie Kroll and his strong-armed man, Bud Slater, were sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of Fred Rimlinger. Frankie Cutter is awarded the juvenile court until he reaches the age of 21. And now this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Mm-hmm.